Why hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with me your host Agassino Zynga and this is episode number 409 that's 409 of the Agassino Zynga show with me your host Agassino Zynga. How are you guys doing? Good, amazing, great to hear. How am I? Same old, same bloody old <laughs> if it's your first time checking out the show via youtube make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe and of course leave me a comment down below if you're listening via the podcast app a five-star review a little share and a cheeky download will go a long way to helping the show get spread hit all the right algorithms and all that nice stuff and of course support via patreon is always more than welcome as ever patreon members get an exclusive bonus show of the agassino zinger show only available to my patreon members so make sure you sign up on there for as little as one dollar per month as little as one pound per month you get access to all those bonus shows only on patreon so make sure you sign up there today at patreon.com forward slash agostino that's patreon.com forward slash a g o s t i n h o click on there subscribe get involved and do not delay today anyway here we are man chilling out um winding down the rest of the week i'm not sure if anybody's celebrating the weekend i guess you are right i got my cup here of mango juice so have a little cheeky sip of that but i wonder i don't i don't normies out there celebrating with the weekend like they were previously those are that was one of the banes of my life being in the office and having to fake converse you know, having to fake enthusiasm not conversation because i can talk for hours as you guys know but faking enthusiasm about people's weekends like oh you know having to pretend you care that you're interested always you know a real bugbear <laughs> a real kind of uh, be my body about something like that which is not doesn't make no sense it's a bit out of order but um you, you quickly realize when you're working with um people like that that people really really enjoy their weekends like they absolutely you know treasure those um you know brief that brief by rest that brief bit of respite they get in the week to do exactly and to be exact no actually to be exactly who they are not to do what they want to do because they do that anyway but i think the weekend for those people again i'm just um hypothesizing here because i don't know these people directly but i would assume there is something to be had for just being yourself for once which is why for the most part in the places i worked in usually the weekend warriors were very strict about who they went out with at work to on the weekends either it was a specific group of people who they trusted with their time and you know not to be bad company and just make it dead or a particular group of people outside of work who they also trusted with their time because guess what they're their friends so you had two groups or you had the other group of people who just didn't give a shit about anyone at work in a social capacity and the moment you know work ended they would just they would literally sprint out of work right sometimes if you walk in the same way home they kind of you know have put their head down they cross the street they pretend they're on the phone anything just to avoid, anything to avoid having to spend any more time outside of work with their colleagues it was always funny those kind of, those people always made me laugh it was okay on the way i think they'd usually be up for a chat on the way there but when it comes to walking home they'll be like look don't come near me don't talk to me don't touch me don't even breathe in my direction i want nothing to do with you which is understandable and it like <laughs> there's nothing worse than trying to um pretend you're friends with people at work who you really don't care about again um i wasn't really that way i just kind of was a bit i was a bit um what's that word called i was a bit um whatever i didn't really care either way do you know what i mean if people were open to be friendly fair enough if they weren't i wasn't really but then when people went out their way to be rude that's when it really touched my balls when someone would actually go out their way to be like hey i don't want to be your friend it always kind of it's, it's kind of normal isn't it? i think the most humans are like that you always kind of take those things to heart and you know take them personally which you probably shouldn't because you never know what that person's going through in their own life but really and truly you don't really care do you know what i mean you just want them to like you and when they don't it's like oh but i'm a good person but yeah the, um i wonder what if people are doing that this weekend or in weekends in general i think so in london i think it's changed especially with us being in tier two and potentially going into tier three i think the weekend has probably um has probably it's probably restored a sense of urgency to the weekend that we probably didn't have prior because you know under tier tier two is the only tier two and lower i guess and one are the only tiers where you can actually go to a bar and hang out and shit or have a drink and eat sort of with a substantial a substantial meal in tier three that completely goes out the window um the only benefit to tier three or the only thing that's actually a good thing for someone like myself is the idea that you can still go to the gym and stuff so i'm assuming if you are a weekend person you have to make sure you make the best 
you make the best out of this weekend coming up or this weekend you know if you listen to this today to later so you, you would know saturday onwards you have to make the best out of it man you can't let it go because more likely than not from the next weekend onwards i reckon now london will be in tier three and that's going to be a whole other bit of mess um and the, i think the plan they're trying to do is like oh they're trying to get us into a higher level tier to limit the spread of covid and then the idea is when they open things back back up again for the brief period of time before christmas that like we have like this five day grace period where you can sort of um socialize between houses they will then close it back up again and then hopefully the plan i'm assuming is that sometime in a new year when the vaccine rollout starts ramping up um everyone will be inoculated who is obviously at risk and then it'll be safer to go outside i'm assuming um but even though you know these plans are all um hypothetical um you don't know they might just throw a spell in the work and be like you know they might just do what they do all the time and just say national lockdown for everybody because we don't know what we're doing and then we're all going to be f-u-c-k-e-d right e-e-d whatever that is it how you spell it e-d 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 it doesn't matter but anyway jam-packed show for you today loads of things to get into loads of conversations to uh build upon to expand upon to dive into so make sure you grab yourself a little drinky a little bit of a munch whatever you've got in hand so we can get on with the show and dive on deep (sighs) anyway first things first um time have released their most important cover of the year the person of the year as voted by time and guess what surprise surprise guess who's on the cover no it's not alex jones no it's not george floyd no it's not sam smith no it's not harry styles no it's not kim kardashian no it's not skepta no it's not (laughs) jamie it's not all those people it's Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, of course. Um, and um, first of all, it's not a person, right? It's two people. Um, but I guess it's the whole, you know, um, what's that thing called? Uh, what, what, what's those? It's, it's the whole like um, them piggybacking on the whole pronouns thing, right? Maybe, who knows? But it's, you know, it's retarded regardless. And it's just like, really? After all the political upheaval in the States, after everything that's happened, after, you know, the whole issue with the voting and the fact that Trump is still desperately trying to get uh, ballots recounted in his favor um, with the how the elections, you know, rolled out in, a, in general with the debates, with the Democratic nominee uh, elections and how that, you know, kind of shook out. Really? These are two people you pick? You pick a dude who a lot of people are accused, who a lot of people alleges maybe on borrowed time let's say borrow time that's the right phrase to use no you, you pick a dude who might be mentally incapacitated and then you pick a woman who by all purposes didn't she garner like one of the lowest amount of votes in a democratic election um or in a democratic um election run right she did really badly in that if i remember correctly and then somehow she got resurrected to be um joe Biden's running mate and suddenly now she's like you know being heralded as the first uh, woman of color vice president. It's like, it's not exactly earned, is it? It's not exactly as if the, as if the public have really warmed to her as a person in Kamala Harris. So it's a very interesting cover nonetheless. Again, I think you'd probably, it would probably make sense in a really um, bipartisan sort of like critical way to be like, you know who the person of the year is? It probably has to be Trump, especially with the amount of attention he's garnered with the amount of, you know, just as a as a singular force, even for good or evil, regardless of what way you, you, you think a coin flips on him, he would probably be your man of the year or person of the year. Sorry, not man of the year, person of the year. He definitely would be. Um, he'd be up there for the running because like him or love him, he's impacted, especially the States in, in in a in, in a more profound way than anyone could have imagined when he you know ran in the first place that probably would have made more sense but you know who really gives a shit when's the last time you read a time magazine the last time i saw a time magazine in person might have been in an airport or something that's the only place you see them airports and hotels and people don't really stay in hotels anymore well i don't people in my age group usually are on airbnbs so it's difficult to kind of just 
stumble across one and know what's what these things are doing so you know the, the digital side of this stuff matters a lot they've done a complete rollout with it they've got their own personalized hashtag of course with time poi and the little uh iconic red border around it there so they've you know it's been a i'm sure it's been a good um it's been a good acquisition tool right it's allowed people to come in come into the funnel in some way shape or form in a marketing term so i'm sure it's worked but in terms of actually, in terms of apps actually influencing culture, I think the people on the cover have probably done a better job as opposed to the magazine. No one really gives a shit, I think, overall. But it got me thinking, like, off the back of this, um, the person of the year uh, pick being revealed, and also Taylor Swift deciding to re release, no, deciding to release a second album of the year, right? She had the first one earlier on and she put out some second album again. I'm not listening to no Taylor Swift album, could give a shit. But it just got me thinking in general because it was trending like for what, a good 24 hours when it came out. And I was like, wow, man, imagine kind of being the kind of person who's rooting for somebody to win person of the year of time cover and also who's looking forward to listening to a new Taylor Swift album. That person definitely exists, right? That That's a functioning member of society right who pays their bills pays their taxes looks after their family goes out on trips to their friends and in their spare time they flick through time magazine and they eagerly await the dropping of a or the release of a taylor swift album it's like yikes like it, obviously it could never be me but it's like imagine that being your reality day to day you look forward to taylor swift albums coming out like you can't wait to hear what her next lyrics are going to be like or what kind of melody she's using or the fact that she tapped into you know tapped in with this um well-known singer songwriter it's like oh, i don't know man sometimes again I, I i give everything a try because i'm not like a musical snob that way i listen to just about everything um but sometimes you hear stuff and you're like you know what this is just not for me it just cannot be me it's like um when i try to listen to um who's that guy from one direction it might have been I think it was Liam Payne. Liam Payne, one of those dudes. He put an album out where he's like standing on a chair, right? And it's like one of the worst album covers of all time, right? It has to be up there of the last decade. It's terrible. I don't know what's going on there. Um, no, no explanation can exp no explanation will explain why a man is just standing on a chair looking out into the distance. It doesn't make any sense. And the album is even worse. You know what? F scrap that. The album cover's not bad. But then when you play the album, the uh, the actual songs have no tie-in with actual album cover it doesn't make any sense it's like it's like if you had an album cover with the dude covered in blood right like in a very gothic emo -y type of way and then you suddenly you play it and it's just full of pop records you're like what the fuck is this right maybe it'll be interesting in terms of throwing you a curveball but you would assume you have a feel for what the musical sound like by the album cover right um that's where I would, I would assume a lot of, you know, artists, artists, like actual, you know, bona fide musical artists who take their work very seriously. I would assume the album cover is as important or they probably spend as much time on the album cover as they spend on actually making the album. In some cases, I think. I'm sure there's some artists who exist who would say, hey, the album cover comes to me before even the actual body of the work gets fleshed out or before I even a note is even pressed on the keyboard. I have an image in my head of what the album cover will look like. Or it's a moment of brilliance, just a, it just arrives to you. But regardless, there is something artistic. You are kind of, it's all sort of um, tied in with each other, right? The tonality, the word choicing, um, the instrumentation, the, you know, the production overall, all of these things sort of tie into it, right? Artistic and creativity. But you listen to that Liam Payne, and again, maybe I'm being a little bit out of the way, out of order because it's Liam Payne and it's not Lady Gaga or whatever. But God damn it, it was bad, man so terrible legitimately one of the worst albums i've ever listened to and i, I don't I, I i just it's so rare for me to do this too like i legitimately delete it from my itunes and i rarely do that i, I was just you know this is something download it i'll be like you know I, I took the hit i took the hit in it but i don't go out of my way to actually go and remove it but i had to remove this from my from my uh library and it was my physical itunes library i removed it i was like you know what i cannot have this in my itunes library I cannot have any scenario where I'm somehow at home shuffling my entire library and it stumbles upon a flipping Liam Payne record. That just cannot happen. Um, but yeah, imagine living that world. So if, if you're that person and you do live in a world where you enjoy reading Time Magazine and listening to the latest Taylor Swift Liam Payne record, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to know why. I'd love to know what the appeal is. I'd love to know. I would love to know. 
um, talking about loving to know, a very, very gruesome and unfortunate accident that uh, happened earlier on in the UK, especially specifically in London, in North London, where a car happened to plow into um, a group of pedestrians who were just walking on a sideway, right, on a sidewalk um, on our pavement. And at first, when it, you know, when I saw the news leaked, I kind of assumed it was some sort of terrorist attack, which obviously is horrendous. Um, but then as the story progressed and you saw some more images and stuff online, it was just a reckless driver who was just impatient, um, who happened to get himself in a really unfortunate um, accident, which went ahead and injured a whole bunch of people. And just think to yourself, like, how inconsiderate of somebody. Fair enough, nobody, I think, is critically injured so far. It still doesn't mean, you know, they haven't probably suffered some life-changing injuries, but I'm just praying that so far nobody has passed away. So it's just been some very, you know, um, serious injuries in terms of a car hitting you on the sidewalk is never going to be great. But the fact that it's just because a guy didn't want to wait um, for his lane to be free um, is just really annoying. So this is the article here from The Guardian. It says, five injured after car mounts pavement in North London. It says the following. Um, zoom in here. It says a car plowed into pedestrians on a pavement in Stamford Hill, North London, injuring five people. Police did not believe the driver of the incident, which happened after 9.30 a.m., was acting deliberately. The area is a home to a large Jewish community, but the military and police said the incident was not believed to be a terror-related or a hate crime. One local person at the scene said the driver worked worked nearby despite initial concerns none of those involved in this life-threatening conditions are, are in life-threatening conditions and their families have been informed and confirmed a witness said the driver claimed that his brakes had failed he was car veered across the road and onto the pavement eventually crashing into a tree the witness told uh, pa media that the driver of the silver toyota was in shock after the crash which left the car with a crumpled bonnet and a smashed windscreen and damaged the bus stop like it's completely written off right and for those of you listening it's a car that's essentially crashed into a tree so you can imagine what that looks like um the entire bond has been scrunched up all the way up into the windscreen um the car doors have opened because i'm assuming the force just popped the doors open um the airbags have all inflated and for the most part you know uh it's just it's a write-off um it continues to the witness said i heard a bang that was when the car hit the bus stop the car on the curb and i saw two people flying in midair after that he hit the mitsubishi car over there and this car did a 90 90 degree rotation another guy on crutches got hit jesus christ <laughs> what bad luck imagine being on crutches in the rain um on a friday evening or whatever it, this happened right um you know hopping on your way to the sh hopping along your way to the shop listening to some music or whatever it may be and having absolutely no idea because i'd imagine if you're because when i'm on the pavement I'm, I'm sure about you guys i'm looking on the sidewalks i always try to have special awareness i'm always very especially if i'm walking on a very busy um if i'm walking alongside a very busy highway a very busy road and you're on the pavement i always try and i just always keep my you know eyes out i don't walk close to the road if they if i know buses are passing by in case the wing mirror kind of hits me in the back of the head because i'm tall like those little things right just try and keep my eyes around but i would imagine if you're on crutches you're not really thinking about your spatial awareness right you're just concentrating on making sure you can kind of hop your way along to the shops right you're not really thinking about what's behind you because for the most part you're assuming most people that come behind you aren't going to be they're not going to be like pushing you to move out of the way. They're going to usually kind of go around you. They're going to be able to understand it because they can quite clearly see that you are, you know, your mobility is impaired. So you can just imagine how it just must have caught someone like that by the blind side. Or, you know what, what, what what's worse? Walking on crutches along the road and a car crashes in behind you and you have no idea or seeing it coming in front of you and you can't move it out of the way or you can't move enough. You can't move out of the way enough to make a difference. What's worse? I'd much rather it come behind me personally. I'm much rather it just hit me from behind. I have no idea. I, you know, I just go up. I see my my feet in the air. It goes black. I wake up and I'm in the hospital. I'd rather that than having to see it coming towards me and I'm and I just can't do nothing because I'm hopping. <laughs> a few elderly continues the article. A few elderly Jewish gentlemen helped the driver out of the car. People in the shop came out to help. I called the police and they were here in two or three minutes. I saw five people getting treated, including the driver. He was an older looking man in shock. Yeah, you can imagine Stanford Hill is full of um Jewish people and loads of police officers, so it's the perfect place. It's 
a perfect place for something like that to happen because it's always going to be somebody at um so it's going to be somebody that can come to the scene quite quickly so that was very beneficial and it's nice sort to hear that it wasn't anything anti-semitic at all that would have been um a very unfortunate incident so the driver was identified as a furloughed worker at a nearby kosher um grocery store crude brews and spritzer by an employee who declined to name the man he said he was in his 70s and he was employed there for as long as 40 years but had not been working because of health fears of his age he was a very careful man always big with health and safety a very nice man he was i love how he said he was because you can't really call someone careful when they you know crash into five uh random pedestrians so we were all in shock it's such a surprise i think something must have gone wrong technically with a car or inside him and a health issue maybe he has a nice human that's what they say right but you see the actual video of what happened it's probably worse because what it looks like again this is just a video that i've got online here from twitter that someone shared earlier it's a stanford hill does not look like a reckless speeding car whoops let's pause this a bit let's go back so the caption here says the following stanford hill does look like a reckless car speeding in the bus lane trying to avoid a side swipe um shortened footage graphic okay so i guess it's not really very english so basically what it's showing if you're not reaching not watching it's showing a dash cam of some sorts on somebody's rear view that's capturing um how the accident basically rolled out right and then uh, obviously in the uk we have the main road and then you have the bus lane or the bike lane where all the you know buses and bikes are allowed to pass and we're very strict about that right they're unusual on these sort of roads there's cameras all over the place so if you do go and driving those um in driving that lane the camera will pick you up and you'll get a fine for the most part so drivers are usually quite um wary of kind of you know careering into that lane to get ahead or whatever it may be but there are some occasions where people are just like you know what fuck it i'll take the fine i'll take a 50 pound fine because i need to get somewhere but what it looks like is that this driver was i don't know how late he was was absolutely tearing it down that lane right in the first place so he shouldn't have been driving down there anyway but in some time you see the car in question come into focus and there it is it's coming into it's coming into focus and it's absolutely tearing it down that lane now it could be because he was accelerating and he just couldn't de-accelerate and the car just kept going but it does look like it was picking up speed on purpose and that could make sense because it's a bus lane he didn't want to spend too much time in there or pick up a fire so he might have just been trying to get go as quickly as he could to the front of the lane of the adjacent lane so he can just tuck in and obviously um you know overtake people that have been you know sat in traffic for the best part of 10 plus minutes so there it goes it's careering down and what ends up happening, which is, you know, classic, is that as he's careering down, another car from the lane that he should be in pulls out into the bus lane. I'm guessing the driver still, as he says, cannot brake. He then tries to avoid the car coming that, that's be, that he's behind. And then he ends up mounting the pavement and absolutely smashing through it. Like absolutely insane, man legitimately one of the most insane things i've seen and again most of it from what i've seen so far is just due to somebody just being impatient and not being willing to wait it's just so unnecessary man it's so it, it kind of reminds me a little bit selfishly it's so it kind of reminds me a little bit of the level of selfishness like anti-mask people have where they sort of like you know refuse to abide by the store rules and wear a mask for a couple of minutes as they're ordering their flipping subway sandwich which then puts everyone else at risk and just generally causes a bit of a nuisance and unnecessary grief to the people working there yeah forget the whole putting people at risk thing right even if you don't believe it i don't care you're just making the server's job up you know um harder than what it needs to be and i think the same thing with this right it's like the people at the bus stop that got hit the people going to a supermarket or going to the off licenses it's none of their fault that this driver wanted to get to work on time because he was running late or just you know whatever happened he didn't need to do that and the fact that he was you know trying to uh, save some time and then he ended up you know grossly negatively affecting all these random people's lives just so he could save some time is just oh yeah it's nothing worse than this man but who knows he's 70 years old it could be true it could be a mechanical failure it could have just been unlucky and he was trying to stop the whole wave because imagine even if the <sighs> Even if you what, even if the imagine if it's true, how is he meant to stop? Right, like he's careering down a road which might be downhill. He's picking up speed. Um, it's a, it's just difficult, isn't it? I guess you could maybe you could pull into a side road. I don't know. Regardless, hopefully everyone involved gets better very very soon because that wasn't a good situation. That wasn't a good situation at all. Next on the list, we have an update via K Bur about K Burley, Sky News presenter who 
unfortunately got herself involved in a bit of bother um, over a 60th birthday party. Again, I mentioned prior, isn't it? Six, birthday party is absolutely killing celebrities left, right and centre um, during COVID. They, they, it seems to be the the one thing most um, public figures just cannot, um, ref, they cannot, um, they just cannot not celebrate, right? They have to celebrate their birthday in a public manner as much as possible, which makes you, you know, think really about, you know, is it really for them or for us? Who knows? But regardless, this is from the BBC. It's confirmation that Kay Burley of the Sky News presenter has been suspended now for six months for breaching COVID. And, you know, as you know, the story goes, she went for a drink and a meal with some friends. Her story is that she was uh, dying for a loo, dying to go to the toilet. Um, she couldn't go back to the restaurant, so she had to go to another one to pop in, have another drink and a meal. And then she decided to go back with her friends who she came out with to her house to have a little after hours locking, right? And obviously, you know, um, you're not meant to mix households. You're not meant to bring strangers in your home. You're not meant to jump around and go to different bars all the time. So it was loads of bridges of, of COVID happened there. But the only thing I have an issue with this is that why are we holding Sky present you know news presenters to a higher standard than elected officials? When this whole issue happened with Dominic Cummings earlier, and you know for the most part, most the only people defending Dominic Cummings are like you know staunch Tories or conservatives, right? Because it's like a you, you fall into a sort of like party politics loyalty thing. But generally, right, in terms of optics, in terms of uh, compliance um, with the nation, it just wasn't a good look that you know one of the people um involved with the government a prominent member had been caught doing the very thing that everyone else shouldn't be doing right and try to excuse it away as if like they didn't break the rules right they went to the edge of breaking the rules but just didn't break it they kind of bent the rules to suit their favor and it really didn't help with the whole collective bargaining and sacrifices during the start of covid i really don't think again it's not all dominic cummings fault but it just didn't help but there was lots of excuses made for his behavior again maybe he, he broke the rules maybe he didn't but he just had to fall on his sword right for the greater good if you wanted to say hey we're going to send a strong message let's just do it they didn't do it you know um, Boris Johnson obviously backed him no one wanted to um, say that he should be fired or have to resign and of course Glenn McCummins didn't want to resign and effectively he ended up resigning at the end of what earlier on was it yeah a few weeks ago he kind of announced that he's going to be leaving um, number 10 at the end of the year or I think of the, uh, the end of January but regardless um what you did see after the fact was that, you know, I think the Tories saw they made a bit of a PR blunder. And then the next time that they had to do a public show of compliance when Boris contracted COVID, he was locked in, you know, his office or his home for, you know, the entirety of the quarantine. Whenever he came on camera, he was remotely doing it. So they did notice that they made a bit of a PR blunder in that regard. So they kind of fixed it later on. But, you know, I've, I've not heard of any political uh figure or mp get suspended for this level of time i know there's a lady that supposedly got covid and knowingly brought into the house of commons i'm not sure what happened to her but from what i know so far i'm not sure any elected official has uh got a suspension of the severity the same level of severity that Kay Bailey has i just don't think that's happened which is again a very odd thing indeed but this is a quick little article here from bbc um, it says the following Sky News presenters Kay Burley is to stay off air for six months after admitting breaking COVID rules during a night out uh, for her 60th birthday party. Political editor Beth Rigby and North London correspondent um, Isman Rashid, who are among those with her, will be absent for three months. I made a big mistake and I'm sorry, Burley wrote on Twitter. Burley was among 10 people who went to the restaurant on Saturday before she briefly went to another restaurant. She then moved on to a private residence where individuals were at least from at least three different households mix the bbc has been told the interesting part about it is that obviously the funny part about it if you're an observer is that beth rigby and k burley were like on the front lines with like really putting it to you know tor various uh tory politicians about um their unwillingness to comply with covid regulations uh break you know just just putting it on them continuously so for these two women to be caught out in the same very fashion that they kind of lambasted those guys for is very ironic and then of course they were also the same people who were very um uh who are very kind of adamant in their position that nobody should be allowed to have any sort of fun or any sort of you know um freedom of movement during covid because of course the idea was they didn't want to overwhelm the nhs and you know that, that whole song and dance so i guess from an outsider's and purely um, neutral point of view it is a quite a funny turn of events
continues here it says i have got today agreed to sky news to step back from my break casting role after a period of reflection she wrote i wonder if she gets paid during that six months that's going to be a cushy six month fitness to be at home of course for someone like a k belly she wants to be in front of the television cameras and you know um you know give your um just do your job in it right i'm sure she loves doing what she's doing i think she's been doing it for 30 plus years she mentions in a statement so i'm sure she's not going to be loving being at home um and i could also imagine she's going to want to say a thing or two about what people have been saying online but if you're getting paid to stay at home on a suspended this is yeah on a, on a temporary suspension or suspension not temporary it must be an all right kind of you know thing it continues here so it's clear to me that we are all in this fight against COVID together and we have a duty to stick firmly by the rules. It doesn't matter that I thought I was COVID compliant on a recent social event. The fact is I was wrong and I made a big mistake again. Fair play, she admitted it. Um, some dear friends and colleagues, some of the most talented and committed professionals in our business have been pulled into this episode and I regret this enormously. I was one of the founding presenters of Sky News. No one is proud of our channel reputation and professionals and our team and the impact we make. I very much look forward to being able to continue my 32 year career in Sky when I return. That's very interesting she put that. I wonder if that was like a sort of like, hey, please remember I've been here for very two years don't fire me i love you guys right because i think they could uh, yeah, no maybe not legally you don't think you could like fire them all i i guess you know i'm sure if they haven't you know done anything untoward prior to it they probably have to give them a warning and then kind of review as go along but there's beth rigby herself beth rigby hasn't said nothing on social which has been quite funny because she's been very vocal and loud and all over the place during covid you know keeping us abreast with all the news but she's been very very quiet on the old social media during this whole affair which is i right to say the least it continues said um the channel said it is complete an internal review into the conduct of a small number of team members who attended the social event on saturday over the course of the evening uh covid guidelines were breached a statement said sky news respects all our team members to fully comply with the covid restrictions all those involved regret the incident and have apologized following our review of what took place on 5th december we have agreed that beth is man um and that will not be on air for three months and we have agreed that Kay burley shall be on not regret for six months which is fine and i guess if you're the main instigator and you organize the house party you should get the fair stick of the treatment but yeah what do you reckon um is this a bit excessive i think so or is this um a, a welcome uh punishment for two women who were kind of you know putting on others i would like to know who knows who knows moving on what else do we have here bish bash bosh bish bash bosh bash bosh bish bash oh yeah we've got top boy in it top boy top 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 boy so i'm sure most people are aware no most people are aware some people might be aware that um jack Grealish, um superstar uh aston villa midfielder and soon to be england legend got himself involved a little bit of uh unfortunate no he had an unfortunate image leak onto the interwebs which depicted him in a fashion that he probably would not want to be depicted in public but it also gave us a wry little smile as to what this guy gets up to behind closed doors and it made him just that much just that bit more of a legend than he was already in our heads right jack Trish is already an incredible player right probably one of the best player players in the premier league if not the best premier league, was best player in the premier league considering the kind of pressure he plays at at aston villa right coming out on that pitch knowing full well that if he doesn't perform what seven out of ten onwards upwards he's most his team will team will most likely lose and if they lose enough games they'll get relegated he's basically carrying Birmingham on his back um, individually um, he's a complete throwback in terms of how he plays as a player low socks um, taking on players all the time taking responsibility shooting from range uh, great skills great passing ability and just generally like a player that always seems to be up for it right just a real real throwback and personification of everything that you kind of want to see in a really talented English football player right one of the ways in the front foot always aggressive powerful eager to get into a tackle help out the team and wins should die for the shirt basically and then you get to hear about his interest and his, pref his preference for let's say the equivalent of rum right when it comes to the ladies and then you see this video that kind of uh, resurfaced again uh, where he sits down and he basically uh, talks about his preference for the ladies and then I guess you can kind of spot where um, the leak uh, might have come from and what it sort of depicted so this is Jack really is talking about the kind of girls he's into well, Is there anybody that stands out in your mind? Rihanna Rihanna? Why Rihanna? Because she's pretty That's it 
Well, you know the music? vibes. Are you a fan of her music? Yeah, as yeah, well? I like her music as well. Okay. He likes her music. He doesn't couldn't name. He could, probably couldn't name one track apart from Umbrella. He knows the vibes. Just the fact that she's very, very pretty. Yeah. She's got a feistiness about her though. She might just like look at you and walk off. You know. No, I, I think that's cool. You think that's cool? Yeah. Look at him getting all giddy. Look at him getting all giddy and blushing. That's pretty nice, isn't it? So. Big up Jack Grealish, man. I think, again, I'm not really, maybe it's just me, but I don't really give a crap about what my footballers get up to on their spare time. I really don't. I could care less what they put up their nose, um, what they drink, what they drive, who they're with. I could really give two fucks. I just want them to perform when they step on their football pitch. And maybe that's because I kind of, from afar, I've always admired how the US athletes or the US yeah US athletes and in various sports are just able to kind of be themselves within the sport into some degree and also outside of it more often than not no one really kind of um, questions the fact that you know Le- like certain players not LeBron but they say certain players you know attend fashion week shows in Paris during the season or you know do p- p- certain television movie things as long as they're performing on the court on the pitch on the field no one really cares but the good thing i think as well about the the sort of fair thing to point out in the states too it seems like as soon as you do stop not performing on the field they will quickly bring up those pictures that they found right of you in carbo of you doing this or you doing that so that's the uh, one thing but i think in the uk it seems like we want all our professional footballers to be very you know suit and tie hands behind the back like giving one word answers right um you know i'm happy for the team happy for the team happy for the team sort of question answers and in the moment we get a player that's got a bit of personality got a bit of swagger about them dare i say um we want to kind of extract it from them by divulging every little thing that they do and blasting it all over the papers that's not necessarily the way to go i think for the most part most people on social are quite fair i think everyone's kind of like like you know what i, I like to see this sort of personality you want to see a jack vardy you know um a james vardy sorry um sly tackling a flipping corner flag and snapping it into and smashing it into different bits of pieces right you want to see him cupping his ear to an empty stadium and winding up fans that aren't even in there you want to see that kind of stuff um you don't want that thing to kind of get rubbed out of players and i think nowadays it seems like they tend to do that quite often but big up jack Grealish for being himself and giving us a little bit of uh of uh, of a smile on the timeline over the last couple of days it's been very entertaining to see that kind of play out for sure for sure this is an article which is absolutely wild right this is from variety right and it made me really it, it won't say it made my blood boil but it definitely was another reaffirmation as to why most people um most people in entertainment or yeah in culture in general why they're so excited and so um dismissive of like the entertainment industry structure as it is or the industry and they always want to kind of do their own thing and doing their own thing has sort of been promoted to a really high level and most people are kind of you know um, producing their own shows writing their own scripts uh you know just kind of talking directly to their consumer base right or to consume directly to their fans instead of kind of going through the hollywood industry way where you sort of cultivate your fan base through a studio via movie via film whatever it may be that's kind of like the the standard procedure to go do those things but it seems like you know that's sort of changing over time and with that comes an adjustment right the industry has to kind of adjust they sort of have to kind of change how they do things they kind of have to look um re-evaluate what their appeal is in the industry now and why i say that is because if you're an award show right and you want to hire i don't know a really popular tiktoker to present it you might have to um go back to the drawing board and recalculate just how much you're willing to pay them because of the amount of money that they see on their end on their platform when they're having to deal with these brands and these corporations directly they won't be willing to accept what you pay a tv star or a movie star or a sitcom actor or a sitcom actress because those people are sort of kind of going through the motions and abiding by the industry path or tried and trusted route in order to become a star but if you're going to hire one of those people that sort of like you know sit outside of the industry you are going to have to rethink how you approach them and you know and what kind of business you do and i think this kind of goes to some extent to explain what happened with tiffany haddish this is from variety it said why tiffany haddish turned down hosting a grammy's pre uh grammy's pre-telecast exclusive um so this is from 
Mark Malcolm said the following. Tiffany Haddish was asked to host the Grammys pre-lit, pre-telecast ser- premiere ceremony. Reading out loud is annoying, isn't it? <laughs> but the comedy superstar says she turned down the offer when the Recording Academy told her that she he had no pay. She had to pay her own way, right? This is for the Grammys. Fair enough, it's the pre-telecast premiere, which you you know usually see online. Um, it's where they kind of give the awards to people who aren't necessarily... Maybe it's like singer-songwriters and genres that people aren't really interested in in general. Um, and all the other kind of... Ex, you know, ex, the other kind of extra Grammys that kind of go out there, they usually kind of run through on a pre-telecast, but it's still an important part of the show. Um, a lot of the people are actually involved in, you know, moving and shaking of the industry. The actual uh, power players, uh, I would say, the actual people of influence, they're the ones that are there. So it's a really big deal. And in general, it's a Grammys, it doesn't matter, right? For them to offer her no pay is just, um, just insane. It continues. Not only did... Um, they asked Haddish to host the three hour live streamed event without any compensation. But she tells Variety that they wouldn't even cover hair, makeup, or wardrobe for the three hour event. She says, All of that would have come out of my own pocket. I don't know if it's um if this might mean I might not get nominated ever again, but I think it's disrespectful. And it definitely is. And this is something I've only learned recently through listening to various hip hop podcasts, right? About the differences of managing a female and a male artist. I never had any understanding or appreciation about how different it is to get um, a female artist ready for a walkthrough, let's say, right? Or for a gig in a 250 seater or 250 capacity club as, it, as compared to kind of getting a dude ready for that same gig. It takes maybe two times double the time right and maybe three times the investment that you would do in a guy right a guy could probably rock up in a hoodie that he wore to a studio the day before and perform to a packed out sold out show of like 250 upwards of people but a girl probably can't do that right hair and makeup uh clothes um whatever else that needs to be done all these things have to be considered so for her for them to offer no um compensation whatsoever for those things which are incredibly important is uh just beggars belief it continues haddish is nominated for a second grammy this year for best comedy album for netflix black mit uh Black Mitzvah, following her first um, nom in 2018 for the spoken word of for the last black uniform, the 63rd Grammy will take place in January 31st, 2021. Contacted by Variety, a rep for the Recording Academy noted that the premiere ceremony is not a CBS program and is hosted by the Academy, a not-for-profit organization, and that all hosts, presenters, and performers are traditionally performed gratis, including this year, which is insane if that is true. I don't think it is. I think they're trying to cover their bases, but if you're telling me everyone goes to the Grammys for free and that doesn't get any sort of appearance fee or whatever it may be, I'm not believing you. I don't care. There's too many egos and uh, per- big personalities involved in that room for them to accept not being paid. Um, it was like, continues there. I was like, the exposure is amazing, but I think I have enough. I appreciate you guys asking, Hadis said. And as much as I appreciate the honor of being nominated, that's not okay. Of course it's not. About 70 awards are handed out during the pre-telecast. Last year, Imogen Heap hosted a pre-show, which was streamed on Grammys.com and CBS. And it said at the bottom, this is something that needs to be addressed, had it said. How many other people have they done that? It's like a guy asking you on a date, but telling you you have to pay for it. Yeah, kind of, I guess. Not really, but I understand the analogy. And then, of course, um, in an expert bit of damage control, a rep from uh, the Grammys came out and essentially, you know... Um, spoke about what essentially happened and tried to clear the air to some varying degree and you know try and explain away exactly what exactly occurred here oh my god so this is from where is it from the hollywood reporter so recording academy apologizes to the haddish so it says yeah the, the harvey mason jr posted a video message to instagram on thursday explaining that a booking agent had a lapse in judgment he said the following so it's been brought to my attention that the recording academy um the recording academy sorry invited tiffany haddish to host this year's premiere ceremony um unfortunately without me knowing a talent booker working for the academy told miss haddish that we wouldn't even cover a cost while she hosted this event for us to me that was wrong i'm frustrated by that decision it was put in poor taste and was disrespectful to the creative community i'm part of the creative community and i know that this feels like and it's not right now 
it's also not right. I feel like they've kind of like um, thrown the booker under the bus. I'm sure the booker was given um, permission to say these things to these celebrities. I'm sure they're not running off the seat of their pants, right? This is like a bit unfair. They're making it seem like they made the decision themselves when more likely than not that higher ups are the ones that told her what her remit, her, he or she, what their remit was in terms of hiring and making sure people are confirmed to do X, Y, and Z. So that isn't fair. And um, it's also this idea that a talent like Tiffany Haddish would be spoken to by what paramounts and maybe somebody on the lowest rung of the ladder. Why wouldn't there be somebody in between that would kind of act as a core of go-between, let's say, right, to make sure things get sorted out, to make sure certain things are covered, bloody blah, blah, blah. Why would you be um, leaving the responsibility of somebody, you know, especially of somebody, again, maybe it's because Imogen Heap isn't maybe as culturally relevant as somebody as like a Tiffany Haddish, but if you do decide to go somebody for of her standing, you have to have people that, you know, know what she's about, will treat her like the star that she is and will make sure that there aren't these mistakes these mistakes don't get made in the first place anyway it continues he says frankly miss haddish was gracious enough to allow me to have a conversation with her i apologize to her personally and i apologize to her for the academy i express my regret and my displeasure about how this event went down it's handled mason ended the message by apologizing again and thank you Haddish, for allowing her to speak to him on this matter jesus but yeah but again it's just another reminder as to why I think as a creative, you should just stay out of the industry. I've always kind of thought that was a way. I think it's probably beneficial to stay as far away as you can from the industry for as long as you can. And then if need be, and you want the extra boost and you want the extra recognition and awareness and maybe co-sign of your talent and with your accomplishment over the years, because I think you've seen that with Andrew Schultz, right? He just recently announced that um, he secured a, a Netflix special uh, yeah, a Netflix comedy special, which, you know, kind of goes against everything that he's been speaking about in general over the last few years in terms of ownership and doing it on your own platform and knowing your worth and blah, blah, blah. But it does seem like he's reached that stage where it'd be nice to get some brand recognition and acknowledgement that you are doing your thing and it's you know it's of a level that can live on a platform like netflix right i don't think netflix you go to these kind of platforms for approval we just want to know that you know the industry knows that you have the ability to do that on their platform but then you can also go back and do your own thing i think that's the best way to do it personally to, to kind of dip in and dip out but um depending on them to guide you through your career and to help you uh you know uh boost your signal and to reach more people um along the way it's just not it like i don't even know where someone like a tiffany maybe you have contacts where does she start to even get people to help her pull clothes do her makeup for free during grammys i'm assuming everyone's going to be booked right I've, i'm assuming it's like the grammys would be like new year's be like a new year's eve or halloween right you know you have to get your halloween outfit sorted out weeks beforehand because most likely they're not things are going to be sold out I'd imagine during Grammys, most of the hair and makeup people are fully booked. They've got their clients they work with, um, agencies, production, whatever, right? They're already booked up, uh, maybe months, sometimes years in advance. And so how you have to pull up and ask them to what? Do it for free on their end too? Because I'm sure that, you know, you don't want to skimp. What are you going to do? You're not going to get someone from Craigslist to come to your makeup because they can do it for free. You're going to do it with the industry standard. God almighty, man. So, again, it's not even my business and it's affecting me like this. Absolute madness. <clears throat> what else is on the list here? <clears throat> yeah, this was an odd one, isn't it? This is um another one from uh, The Hollywood Reporter. It says, let Letita Wright faces backlash after sharing anti-vaccine video. My intention was not to hurt anyone. So this young lady, I'm sure most of you are familiar. Um, she starred in the Black Panther most famously, and I think she did one of the Black Mirror episodes. I'm not familiar, if I'm not uh, mistaken. She went online and decided to reshare a video of this guy on YouTube, basically, you know, doing what people on YouTube do and kind of questioning um, the validity of the COVID-19 vaccine or just offering up some, you know, varying points of view as to whether or not the vaccine is safe or not. Now, again, I think most adults, most rational, sensible people 
have made their mind up as to where they stand or whether or not they'll get the vaccine or not. I don't think an extra video or an extra article is going to tip you over the edge. You probably fall on two, you know, three camps, right? Either you're going to get it or you're not going to get it or you're undecided. But either way, you kind of watch these videos not to be convinced, just to be informed. And I think it's within his rights to do to put out the information out there that he's not really convinced about the vaccine in the first place. No harm in that whatsoever. So this is from the Hollywood Reporter. So the Black Panther star posted a YouTube video that questioned the efficacy and the safety of the potential COVID-19 vaccine and posed substantial claims, substantial claims, sorry, about the vaccines general, generally. The city of Wright faced a Twitter backlash after Thursday night after the person linked to a YouTube video questioning whether people should take the uh, prospective COVID-19 vaccine. The Black Panther star tweeted a video from the one on the table, a YouTube discussion channel where the presenter opined at length about the efficacy of the vaccine, the dangers of taking them and the supposed origins of the ingredients of a COVID-19 vaccine. It quote, I don't understand vaccines medically, but I've always been a bit of a skeptic of them. The presenter, Tommy Ariel, me or says towards the beginning of the monologue now if anyone opens up a monologue or a video talking about vaccines talking about virology talking about science talking about anything to do with medicine and they open up and say hey i don't understand this field medically technically but i have questions about it i have doubts I'll just X off the video, back out, X, close the window, minimize, minim minimize the window, whatever, leave a little cheeky thumbs down, like it's not that big of a deal, just keep it moving, but I'm not going to report the person, I am not don't want to get their thing cancelled, I'm not going to, you know, tag journalists into a tweet and hope they get noticed me so that they can write a piece about it, I'll just move on because it really isn't that serious. Um, the presenter Tommy says towards the beginning of the monologue, which is full of unsubstantiated claims amid personal anecdotes and his own feelings on vaccines generally. Standard YouTube video, right? After Wright posted the video on, on Twitter with a prayer hands emoji, she quickly became embroiled in arguments with users taking her to task for using her platform to spread misinformation on vaccines. The base actually so see is currently starring in McQueen's uh, small acts and forgery series, uh, countered that she wasn't against vaccines, but thought it was important to ask questions. So as soon as you ask questions, you're you're just labeled an anti-vaxxer. So she fell prey to that. And it's unlucky for her, because I'm, I'm assuming she doesn't spend too much time on the internet, so she probably does know um how volatile and toxic those type of discussions are so if you're going to get your dip your feet in it you should be ready and armed with your facts to sort of like hit back at people but if you don't then just step away like a couple right and if you get haggard if you get you know pestered online turn off your replies or just shut down yet but you can't just be throwing out you know videos of alex jones talking about vaccines and stuff and think you're not going to get absolutely pelted online by the, the the kind of uh believe in science brigade out there it continues it says i think it's valid and fair to simply ask what's in it she replied to one user following the torrent of twitter users <laughs> admonishing her for posting the video Wright tweeted if you don't conform to popular opinions but ask questions and think for yourself you get counseled which isn't really fair this is this is the whole deal i think the covid thing is a little bit more sensitive than that. i don't think it's just a, simply about saying the, the, a different opinion i just think there are certain topics especially on twitter that if you do have um a different opinion from the masses you will get admonished not all topics but there are some that are just hot button topics that you should just avoid if you don't want your mentions to get flooded with you know anti-vaxxer bots and stuff um or anti-anti-vaxxer bots whoever Late on Thursday night, Wright's Marvel Cinematic Universe co-star Don Chidi was drawn into the controversy. Again, snitches, what are you doing? What's that got to do with it? Um, the Iron Man star responded to Twitter users tagging him about Wright's tweets. <laughs> he's like, well, what are they doing? Snitching to him like he's, the, he's their dad or something. Replying that he will bring up the issue with her directly after seeing the push of the video, tweet, he tweeted, Jesus, just scrolled through hot garbage every time I stopped and listened. He... And everything he said sounded crazy and effed up. I I would never defend anybody posting this, but still, um, I won't throw her away over it. The rest I'll take off Twitter. I had no idea. Again, like, it's just so undignifying for a man to be speaking about a woman like this in public that you know, right? Like, why are you admonishing her in front of people to gain, like, what? Virtue signaling points for people you don't know. You've worked with her personally on a movie before. You know her personally, right? You owe her a phone call. And even not, even that, right? It's not really your business. Why are you even getting involved? You shouldn't even call her. It's none of your thing. Just call her to offer support and say she needs to speak to somebody or there. But this is no way to speak to somebody that you actually work with in a public forum at all 
but hey, what do I know? Hours after engaging with Twitter users on the video, Wright posted another message early on Friday morning. She said, my intention was not to hurt anyone. My only intention was posting a video was it raised my concerns with what the vaccine contains and what we are putting in our bodies, nothing else. As of early Friday morning, it also appeared that Wright's initial tweet with the video had been taken down, but her exchange with fellow users remained live. Wright's plays uh, Shuri, the Black Panther franchise, and with the sequel in 2018, she hit it to begin production in July in the wake of the Star Chadwick Boseman's death RIP some have said Wright's character may be, have more prominent role the Hollywood reporter has reached out to Wright for comment um, and so far I think the latest update with her is that she's I think deleted her Twitter for the most part I don't know if she's think deleted all social media accounts but definitely deleted her Twitter um, again man like annoying situation to be in because I think she could have avoided it by just not sharing the video she could have just liked it on YouTube or maybe just liked the tweet of the video on social media too I think sharing it and putting any kind of opinion out there concerning stuff like this is just too hot button she doesn't need it if you're a Hollywood star doing your thing you don't need to be uh, blacklisted or have a black mark amongst and next to your name especially being a young black lady working in Hollywood as well you just don't need that extra uh, barrier um, for you to navigate in the scene so she probably would have been better off just kind of back away from it and letting somebody else talk about it but regardless if you're somebody that went into a mentions trying to you know uh tell her off and tell her what she should and shouldn't say online give your head a wobble if you're that co-star that's that's in a movie with her too and you're you know publicly getting in discussions about what your co-star did with strangers online as well give your head a wobble everyone needs to just take a deep breath and relax if you're gonna get the vaccine get it if other people don't want to get it let them not get it it's not that big of a deal it really isn't that big of a deal but again, what do I know? What else do we have here? Okay, let's move on. We're in an hour now. Don't want to waste too much more of your time here. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, what is here? We've got the, 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 the. Yeah, this is a good one. This was, let's talk about this then. Where is it? It's moved. Oh, man. Okay, let's talk about this. So, um, I'm sure most of you are aware that um, SpaceX decided to launch or test launch test flight their SN8 prototype of the Starship um, over the last few days and unfortunately it kind of exploded had a bit of a hiccup but still man it's pretty impressive to see something like this happening in real life right IRL it's pretty pretty impressive um, I think the initial test was for it to go up to a certain altitude um, do that amazing belly flop uh, maneuver that it does where it's sort of you know um, turns off a few engines so it could go horizontal and then it sort of falls back down to earth using the flaps to kind of guide its way down and then just as it's about to reapproach um the landing pad it turns a few of the engines back on again so it can go back upright and it sort of slow burns back down as slowly as it can onto a landing strip similar to how the booster rockets do so it's pretty incredible and that's the maneuver that they're going to use when eventually the starship ends up taking um you know human life to um, uh, the red planet that is mars so this is from cnet so spacex starship explodes spectacularly after successfully um successful high altitude test flight right because you know they've they've kind of revolutionized it obviously by making it reusable there's going to be obviously a booster um what can I, what's it called not booster what's it called at the bottom there's going to be another rocket at the bottom that they're going to use to sort of like send it into orbit and then um then they're going to that rocket's going to come back refuel and then refuel it again and keep going back up in four times before it goes to mars so the idea is to of course get this technique right but in order to kind of iterate as fast as possible to kind of ramp up production and get us going as soon as we can um, because elon musk believes in us being interplanetary species for the I guess for the what you call it to make sure that we survive as a species in the long term because obviously the damage that we're doing to the earth blah de, blah 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 he's decided to do this thing where he's iterated loads of different prototypes I think they have like 14 or something I think it's up to 14 so um this is obviously SN8 um and then of course SN8 exploded so they're gonna go they're gonna gather the learnings from the test flight and then implement that into SN9 and continuing on continuing on continuing on until they have one ready um to take the maiden voyage so this is from CNET but the basic starship explodes particularly after successful um high altitude test flight it says Elon Musk starship prototype as you can see it's falling back to the earth like, look how cool that looks man that is so awesome to see 
Um, yeah, my Starship S N A prototype reminiscent of something Buck Rogers might have piloted fell um, serenely and silently through the Texas sky for almost two minutes on Wednesday. Then its Raptor engines roared to life, uh, righting the rocket into a vertical orientation in preparation for landing. But it was a little too late, or maybe some of both. A few seconds on, and one particular and one spectacular explosion later, SpaceX's latest next generation rocket prototype followed its first successful high altitude flight with a hard landing that sure to be an instant member of the gif and meme halls of fame <laughs> yeah, definitely but look at it it just looks so incredible the flap sort of maneuvering as it sort of tries its best to um the whole idea from what i understand is that they i guess when it i guess the gravity in mars is far greater than it is here on earth so the idea is that it needs to kind of reduce its speed to a certain level so that when it re-enters the atmosphere on mars it can softly land so that's kind of the issue that they kind of have um, here in terms of testing it, because I guess the gravity on Earth is a lot hot, is a lot greater than what it is on Mars. Um, but in general, anyway, that's the best way to land uh, a spacecraft. So I think from what they say, I wonder why you don't just learn like why it's not possible or why it isn't effective to learn a rocket. I guess because it's a rocket and you don't want to make you don't want to kind of take up space with wings. I wonder why you just can't land it like the way an airplane does. That sort of like on the ground that way maybe that's a bit hard in terms of spatial awareness and all that sort of stuff um who knows um it continues here SpaceX found that Elon Musk, who had a long warn that such a rapid, unscheduled disassembly was possible, uh, was among the first delighted on massive, uh, delighted masses, but for technical and primal reasons. He said the following: um, successful ascent here, switch over to header tanks and precision flap control to landing point. So I guess all the points that he wanted to kind of um, run through in a successful manner it happened of course it exploding at the end wasn't you know um something that was planned for but the actual things that are probably the hardest to get right lift off um because for ascent switch over to header tanks precision uh flap control to landing point were all sort of ticked off he continues here it says fuel header tank pressure was low during the landing burn causing touchdown velocity to be high and rud i don't know what that means um but we all got all the data we needed congrats spacex team hell yeah so he's really excited about that great to see man this is latest starship um iteration finally lifted off from its pad around 2 45 p.m on wednesday an early attempt on tuesday was aborted with just one second left due to an issue with the Raptor engines. A few minutes into the Wednesday flight, one of the three Raptor engines stopped firing. According to Musk, each touch shutdown was intentional and the engines did great. So I guess I think we're, because we're already watching it, I think the engine here that we're seeing, we all assumed as SpaceX nerds that there was something wrong with that third engine here. There's three Raptor engines here on the inside, but that wasn't necessarily the case. That was all intentionally done uh, by SpaceX in order to kind of, I, I guessing, to allow it to re-enter to the no maybe, maybe it was just a test in general to make sure that they could individually turn on off and on the raptors who knows this is way above my intake level but i'm still really interested in it it continues about four minutes into the flight a second um engine shut down and a craft seemed to hover for a while until the final raptor shut down yes and it uh began its free fall back to the earth uh, as it approached the ground the raptors and thrusters um, situated under the rocket were used to perform a flip maneuver and orient vertically in preparation for a landing burn like we've become used to seeing with the company's smaller Falcon 9 rockets. That burn didn't appear to slow down its night soon enough or quickly enough as it came in for a rough and explosive landing. Notably, the wreckage showed that it did uh, hit the middle of the landing pad, which is amazing. You can watch the full spectacular here below on our YouTube channel. Yeah, so yeah, amazing to see, man. Mars, here we come. The test flight brings a Starship much closer to a trip to Mars than ever before, but it's obviously still a way to go. He said here, uh, this is st this type of orbital flight is designed to test a number of objectives, from how the vehicle free the vehicle's free Raptor engines perform, and the overall aerodynamic entry capabilities of the vehicle, including its body flaps, to how the vehicle manages propellant transition. SpaceX wrote earlier this week, Mars and SpaceX have continued to improve the company's next generation rocket, intended to eventually transport thousands of earthlings to mars and the moon and other destinations over the past 18 months a handful of short test flights of hops have seen a prototype lift off the pad at Boca chica texas rise to an elevation of 500 feet which is my one of my favorite to see that go up or come back down so cool and then come back down to a soft landing the hops have been remarkable success so far intersped with some dramatic ground test failures along the way next up stakes basic stands apply flight sorry another prototype sn9 and work towards the first orbital flight so 
so absolutely cool to see. So yeah, big up all the SpaceX nerds, uh, Marcus House, and a few other people who I follow online for keeping me updated with all this sort of stuff. It's been an amazing thing to keep my mind occupied, um, sans all the nonsense COVID talk. Uh, moving on in. Yeah, this is one. Let's go to this one. So it appears like as I've mentioned previously here, you know, I'm obviously pining. I think most people, most people in the dance music scene, most people that are fans of going out, nightlife and all that good stuff and festivals are actually pining to go out in some way, shape or form in a very next, in a very immediate future, especially with the vaccine on the way. But I was, I was sort of wondering in a previous podcast why there wasn't enough, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot of excitement or a lot of movement um, on in my inbox mostly, especially in my promotions tab where I usually get um, most of the information regarding festivals and parties and things going on because I'm signed up to a million uh, mailing list. I didn't see any movement um, as soon as the and that was announced that Pfizer obviously has successfully um, developed a vaccine for COVID-19. You would assume off the back of that news, a lot of promoters and event managers and whatever organizers would be racing to let everybody of the fact and to organize pre-sale of tickets for events you know scheduled for next year now it could be because everyone's sort of like tv seeing it and waiting for it to be actually confirmed and for more people to um you know to be vaccinated and maybe for some things to change whatever it may be but you still feel that a lot of promoters would want to jump the gun just to make sure that they kind of are sort of like first in our mind again kind of reminding everybody they're still alive because you know they haven't really been communicating with us in a meaningful way or we haven't been paying attention to a lot of these party promoters and organizers for the best part of a year so they probably want to kind of like hey um we're not i don't want to be outside of our mind remember you remember me but that didn't happen and it got me thinking and then i saw this news on mix mag that was like oh this is not looking good and it's definitely um has a lot of parallels to the original news that I keep mentioning on here of that Variety magazine article where the dude sort of said, hey, don't expect events to come back. I think it was a former, you know, music executive who said, hey, don't expect events to come back until 2022. And he was saying that in March of this year, right? He was saying, don't expect anything until another year and a half or two years. So crazy. So it says the following, this is Mixmac. Glastonbury may be prevented from going ahead in 2021, warn MPs. So, and this is Glastonbury, right? This is one of our premier festivals here in the UK, if not the premier festival. Um, and if Glastonbury can't go on, then don't expect, you know, Love Box or, f you know, what's the other one I went to? Junction 2 and these kind of things to happen. It's not going to, it's not going to work. So, it says here, MPs have warned that major UK festivals such as Glastonbury may be prevented from taking place in 2021 unless their insurance is underwritten due to COVID-19, which definitely goes back to what that guy said earlier uh, in the previous sorry, article for Variety where he said um, the main issue is going to be the insurance companies, right? Not being able to put policies in place in time or not willing to take the responsibility for putting on an event, underwriting and someone getting ill. It continues. Speaking in the House of Commons, Julian Knight, a Conservative chairman of the Digital Cultural uh, Media and Sports Committee, said the UK is a leader in the world in terms of music and arts and festivals. The sector is worth more than 12 billion dollars. Yeah, well, more than 12 billion pounds. I didn't know that. Uh, supports many thousands of highly skilled jobs, as well as the financial lifeblood of the nation's musicians. However, there will be no festival season next year unless insurance is underwritten in the case of COVID disruption. Will the ministers firstly meet with me and the MPs from across this house to see how this reinsurance, uh, to see how this reinsurance can be put in place? And does the minister recognise nothing? Um, noting her answer to the previous question that with a minimum lead time of six months, right, the insurance reinsurance rate needs to be in place now before the likes of Glastonbury commit. So that's something I also I didn't really think about, right, that a lot of these festivals need to have six months lead up time, right, in order to make it work, which explains why a lot of those festivals prior were getting cancelled like in like May, right, sometimes, you know, sometimes April prior, right, that were happening later in the year because they needed lead up time to, I, was, I don't know, get things in place, organise, whatever, or confirm and book people. Um, so it's not something that can be turned around in the space of a couple of months. They need some time to get it going, especially now with the disruptions to, um, what do they call it? They call it something, the disruptions to the supply chain, right? Of course, with this perfect, with this prolonged period of time that we've been out, um, they need to get that going again. So it's going to be a lot of work. So it continues. Cultural Minister Caroline um, Dinagang, or 
Dina J, Dina J, how you pronounce that? Dina J, Dina J, how you pronounce that? Um, she says, festivals are such a vibrant, integral part of our community and our economy. And I'm well aware that many will take decisions very soon about whether they can go ahead next year. So it's a very urgent situation. So again, aware, but let's see the answer. There's a subgroup of my entertainment and events working group looking very specifically about how we can get festivals reopened. And in the last few weeks, I have met with representatives from festivals in Edinburgh and only yesterday with festivals in the Isle of Wight. Okay, good to know, but let's get to an answer. She's doing that politician thing. Um, backbench MP Teresa Vella said, will the minister give serious consideration to the government support for an interdimentary or insurance scheme so that we can still make these decisions in a confidence that if there is a third wave, then their losses are going to be mitigated. And Caroline said, I'm well aware of the concerns of the challenges securing insurance for live events. It's something we're looking at very carefully, but the key really is for the industry is to build an evidence base that absolutely demonstrates insurance coverage is only the barrier of the events taking place. So that's fair. She's basically saying we need to make sure um, that the insurance is the only issue and not the actual safety of the punters. Now that goes to another issue that we're having at the moment that Sasha Lord, um, the Knights are from Manchester and Andy Burnham, the mayor from Manchester are really kind of pushing to the forefront where they're essentially arguing online and you know I've most I've seen on social where they're basically arguing with the people at Sage who are responsible for kind of putting together our COVID action plan that the you know the policy or yeah or the incent the policy that I basically put in place to close certain bars and pubs and restaurants at a certain time 10 p.m curfew had no scientific basis right the idea that most of the hospitality venues were closed for a prolonged period of time well when we were going through you know some of the you know rising cases in the beginning or during our second lockdown, there was no reason why these bars and pubs should have been closed because of the evidence so far that we've gathered through checking and tracing and all that sort of good stuff has indicated that hospitality industry only contributes, I think, to like 5% of the overall cases um, during COVID, right? So the actual idea that you would get COVID from sitting in the bar and hanging out with your friends isn't necessarily true. And it could be said, really argued, that most bars and pubs are kind of taking as many steps, as many precautions are necessary to make sure that they're COVID secure, make sure that they're clean and hygienical, right? They already have to do that prior in order to make sure that they're allowed to open. But especially in this climate, no bar or restaurant is going to take any chances, right? They're going to make sure that they, you know, uh, clean and prepare their place as best as they can so that no one contracts a virus because you would assume if someone contracts it in a restaurant or a bar it's probably going to be curtains for them in terms of reputation so it will be nice to get an idea as to what goes what happens going forward again it's not looking good if they're already talking about Glastonbury potentially being cancelled next year that might mean we'll see a whole slew of cancellations again in the new year which will be a great way to celebrate 2022 2021 sorry um, but again it is looking more than likely that that guy I think I think it was a Coachella dude um, who I mentioned in, the pro, in you know a couple of podcasts prior. He said already from March of this year. He said don't expect any events next year. And he, and he was saying this without even the knowledge of knowing there's a vaccine around the corner. Um, he was always under the impression that we'd go back to events in late or in early sorry 2022. So a long time to wait to get back into a rave. Unfortunately, what can you do? What can you do? Next on the list, what else do we have here? Oh yeah, this is funny because it's talking about DJs. It seems like in my, from what I've seen, observing from the outside, looking in from afar, let's say, DJs and comedians are doing everything in their power, right? To ensure that we are in some sort of restricted fashion of living, some sort of restricted lockdown, restricted mo movement, um, whatever it may be. Uh, for a prolonged period of time like the DJs and comedians are going to make sure that we're in some sort of lockdown until 2025 I swear to god and it's funny that most of the people who are performing who are out there touring out there doing their bits and pieces are the people that you probably wouldn't see if the world was back to normal anyway don't you find that ironic don't you find that really funny that the people who probably shouldn't be out there no the people that probably shouldn't be out there are out there and the people that should be out there are not out there how odd is that? It's really bizarre. And again, think of the people that would want to go, right? 
during a global pandemic to go see Brennan Shaw do stand-up comedy, right? This is him doing the advert, obviously, on his Instagram, showing it, saying San Marcos, Texas. He's in there from, he's on there, he's there, sorry, in there, on there, uh, from January 29th to the 30th. Two thick-ass nights, of course, spelled the thick way to join in with his brand. Tickets go on set 8 a.m. PST this Thursday. And it's like, who would be the person that would leave their home, their humble abode, um, leave their wife and children during this really scary time to go and see Brendan Shaw do stand up. Like you would maybe go and see one of the legends, right? The Chappelle's, the Chris Rocks, the Bill Burrs and stuff, maybe, right? That might be an occasion to go. But to go out of your way to go see Brendan Shaw show in Texas is insane. Legitimately one of the most insane things. And then to top that up, if that wasn't enough, you've got this tweet here from Business Tesno showing. I don't know who these people are. I've never seen these names in my entire life, right? Business Texano uh, posting a video clip of somebody called Felipe Touchman, Tuchman, and Derek Barbol Barbola, Derek Barbola on November 2020 playing in Tulum, Mexico. And um, Tulum, Mexico seems to be the next uh, free location to go and DJ and play at. I think if you're wondering, yeah, I think if you're sat at home thinking, hey, where, where in the world are they not taking COVID seriously? Um, and does it look like, you know, the population are sort of being left to their own devices <laughs> and it's sort of like sink or swim territory. Just look at any DJ or comedians itinerary or, you know, set, you no. Know, uh, dates on their website where they're performing and you'll definitely spot the locations where it's a bit sketchy places that you probably should avoid for the foreseeable future colombia in mexico um now it's india i'm assuming i've seen people announce dates that they're going to play in india and perform in india and a few other spots are popping up of course the middle east uae uae um i've seen someone perform in oman i've seen some play people go to egypt these are the places that everyone's going to because they're the places where for the most part the tourism uh department or tourism board are like look we need tourists here we don't usually get them anyway or sometimes we do and this is always usually our business season we don't care we want these gringos on our shores partying and dancing and drinking our diluted drinks let's get it going and this is uh, felipe tuckman and derek barboa playing somewhere in tolu mexico and it looks like one of the again it's it's, it's always difficult to capture parties on video anyway right it's just hard that's why people should give boiler room a lot more credit than they than they do then they do. people should give a lot boiler room more credit right because especially in the beginning when they used to do some of the parties and you know you see some of the boiler room parties in berlin some of the ones in early ones in london like they were able to capture the vibe the electricity the set the touch the smell the the, just the vibrations of people dancing around each other really well on video which is difficult to do, especially if you're just filming it from freaking gopro or something right in the early days but it's just hard just in general to do but sometimes you see a video and you're like you know what that looks like a shit party and this looks like a very very shit party so imagine leaving your home to go to tolu mexico to go and see these two guys felipe tuckman and derek barbola who might be really great amazing dudes but really and truly there's you know i'm sure in on any other in on any other year right outside of covid you could probably see these guys playing at a host of really amazing sensational locations right probably every other weekend imagine leaving your home to go see them play in tolu mexico like this If I don't get car for this, let me make sure I put it off and on the, the sound so I don't get flipping them um, taken down because you know these videos and stuff always annoying like that. But look at that, it just looks so dead. The first thing you do when you play somewhere where you can smoke behind the decks is smoke behind the decks, of course. Jesus Christ, guys wearing those dumb hats some sort of fist bump i don't know what that is fist pumping it looks like it but it's a bit of a sorry excuse for it so you see that happening and then you see another uh person out there again it kind of reminded me a little bit how dead this video was this epic video do you remember this earlier in the year um this person tweeted it on twitter it said i hope business techno is finished forever because of this crisis nina kravitz here playing a playgrave in italy to a bunch of people who aren't interested in dancing weird vibe it's not really interested in dancing it's just a different scene right you see this often i think if you see videos of um 
what's that place called? Is it Capa Futura or something? It's that festival that's sort of taking place in some weird structure that looks like a um a sort of shelter that where you put buses in or maybe like a market thing. It's a really crazy um location. It looks amazing to to view via video, especially when the video is pointing at the back of the DJ kind of looking outwards, right? You see a lot of those videos and you see a lot of the punters dancing at the front or even to the sides and they're hardly dancing. If anything they're like nodding, whispering into each other's ears, all got sunglasses on, you know, just doing a little side two step. But they're not really going for it. You don't see people actually, you know, losing their minds. It's not really a thing. Of course, this video is worse because you see Nina Kravitz, um, you know, doing her thing in all her glory. And she's just overlooking a bunch of people who are just staring at her like they're at a gig. It's really utterly bizarre. When I saw it at the time, I was like, this is so odd. Um, and it's even odder now looking back at it. But it's just, you know, a reflection of the times, really, because if you're a plague ravey business techno -y DJ, um, you're probably going to be going around chasing the bag, chasing the gigs. And you're probably not going to be playing at the most... Um, uh, let's say uh, rave friendly locations, right? It's usually going to be playing in front of a, a client base who are just more interested in you being there and taking pictures with you or taking pictures of themselves being at the place as opposed to actually partying. But let's look at this video. Good. Dancing as she does. And look, that's a big drop, right? And a really you know on a really decent tune right and look at this crowd nothing from them absolutely nothing phones everywhere this let's go back that's a good ref that's a good reflection of how bad the rave is there's a there's what looks like a professional videographer there right whether or not he's using a smartphone doesn't matter but there's somebody obviously there who's in charge of capturing the event in some way shape or form and there's somebody in front of them with their own phone in frame right so it's a picture within a picture capturing the dear people dancing and there's people shining lights back on them. It's just a perfect amalgamation of absolute madness. And they're, not, they're not moving. And again, this is me playing it, right? I'm keep pausing, but they're not moving an inch. You still got the front of the row here and they're just staring back at her. Like there's not even a hint of movement. Look at them, look. My man just looking at her like nothing's going on. Like, oh, I'm just looking. Staring back, staring back. So again, odd, odd, odd. Doesn't really make any sense. Who knows what's going on there? And then to cap it off, um, you've got this really funny video, which kind of just made me lols. Um, this is from, you know, a, a page that I follow that I'm really a big fan of because obviously it covers um, most of the Innovision crew and what they get up to. Um, but this year has been a bit disappointing because obviously, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of Dixon and then what he's obviously done with Indivision and, and the kind of DJs he sort of brought through and his aesthetic and his perspective on music and his approach to DJ. I'm just a big fan of him personally. So to see him going out during the year and playing all these play rooms, not all of these, he played a couple. It was a bit like, oh, to take it. Like, Jesus, what it, it is what it is. And I guess he has to pay for his kids' private school. People have to do what they have to do. But then you have this video that showed up recently um, showcasing uh, Dennis Horvat, Nina Kravitz playing um, in an event called Rack that it looks like it took place in the UAE, right? In the middle of the desert, legitimately in the middle of the desert. Um, and it looks horrible because essentially what they've done is that they've sort of, you know, provided a little DJ booth that he's playing and all the punters are essentially dancing in what I would describe as hula hoops. I'm not sure. There might be something different. It might be like, you know, markings on the floor, but to me, they look like hula hoops placed on the floor, of, placed on the sand, and then the reveler has to dance within it. And they're sort of like, I'm assuming, spaced out six meters between each other. And again, because it's in the open air, there's this understanding that you can probably fit more people in there, and they're all dancing and essentially trying to recreate the rave uh, atmosphere in the middle of a desert. So I'll play the video for you now to hit so you can see it. And if you're listening, just listen, of course. <music> Look how weird that is, like. And again, I'm not sure these deeds, like no one's counting people's pockets, right? I don't think that's fair. But I wonder, I wonder what the what the what the um rationale would be to <sighs> hmm, what rationale. I wonder how you would explain your this to yourself. Like, you know, you get into DJ, especially at that kind of level in a vision, right? You're playing at some really you know, um, 
you're playing at some very well regarded places you're held up in you know in good esteem in the industry people seem to respect you and if they're sort of like a weird label where they sort of have a really big mainstream following and also a very big underground following they kind of balance it really well if you read, read or listen to a lot of Dixon interviews you could understand a lot of work goes into it behind the scenes to ensure that balance it gets kept right he kind of maybe tipped on one side when he did the old gta thing but he sort of kept it in line and of course the ib for a residency kind of did help to tip it again but he's kept pulling it back again so there by doing all the um lost in sound parties and all this malarkey so there are things that they do that they're very p particular about but i cannot i can't imagine this being a thing that you know they would want to do it might just be like a need like hey this is what it is you know i have high because i whenever i see somebody playing these sort of things especially the more affluent djs or the people who not let's say affluent because you can't count people's pockets but let's say the djs who you would assume get booked quite often outside of you know post you no know, pre-pandemic they were probably getting booked all the time whenever i see people like that playing in most of these events i always think to myself they're definitely out mostly i would assume they're doing it because they need the money like you know they're, they're even though they have a lot of gigs their monthly expenses are so high that they need to ensure that they have a constant flow of gigs coming in to allow them to sort of keep their head above water and the moment those gigs stop it really hurts their ability to just live i would assume that would be the case if not leaving my apartment in you know zurich berlin uh brussels amsterdam to go and play a gig in the middle of the uae with people standing in hula hoops would definitely not be the way i'll be spending my lockdown look how terrible that looks honestly look how terrible that looks genuinely that isn't a party what is that like what is that that, that looks like one of those you know those sort of like team building exercises you go on when you've just joined, when you've joined a company like they go on these yearly retreats and you go out and you sort of do this weird game thing and they hire some shitty dj that they found on flipping i don't know um the yellow pages back in the day and you kind of have to pretend that you guys are having fun when you all kind of want to get out there and go to the nearest bar and get wasted that's what it sort of looks like but you know middle of the desert you can't exactly escape anyway next slide here you got again him playing of course he's got the great fun on the headphones so i'll give him credit on that one but this looks objectively terrible look at it comedians and djs will do anything for the bag like you could legit that's what that's 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 the thing that i think about it you could legitimately pay a dj to play in your toilet for enough money like they would do it like if you gave if you gave a dj 10 grand and said hey play my toilet while i take a shit they would definitely do it like there's no gig that they would say no to it seems like my somebody's <laughs> Video here and then again that just looks of course you've got people here breaking the rules you've got this girl in in between running in between hoops it's just like i'd love to interview some of the people that are actually event attending these events like what brought you here like are you part of like a foreign um government um does your parent do your parents work in politics or banking are you just an influencer that got you know um hit up by somebody from the uae tourism board to come down and sort of bolster their image what exactly brought you here i'd love to know jesus christ you've seen these faces all the time how many how many of these videos have you seen of these raves where you've seen these sort of like quasi hot girl raver types like they exist everywhere especially on these meme pages that they collect all these rave footages you see all these like sort of like scantily clad girls in you know perfectly adjusted breastless dancing next to a dj and sort of like making it look like a good time it's like i guess it's quite cool i guess if you're like the if you're like the daughter of a foreign diplomat or of a you know oil tycoon or something you could be doing worse things right you just be hanging around djs um pretending you're an intern um and just living a life in it and documenting it on your social media platforms there could be worse things you could be doing another slide again who do we see here nina kravis of course who would do legitimately anything anything for the check it seems like it's just absolutely obscene why does somebody of her level of her notoriety of her esteem and industry need to play again not need because again you can't cut people's pockets but it's really bizarre isn't it really bizarre <laughs> Yeah, she playing a bit of a desert, trying to make it fun. Or 
maybe maybe it's not even that much of an issue. Maybe it's just like an an individual oligarch or some an oligarch of some sort deciding to just throw a party in the middle of the UAE. That could be also the case because I'm thinking it's actually a an event program or a booker that put this thing together. It might just be an oligarch. I said, you know what, I'm bored. I'm gonna fly out some friends, a couple of hot girls, a couple of good DJs who I know who who he, they know personally and just put on a party. That could be the case, but it doesn't look like, it looks like this is an event that they sold tickets to two people to go and attend. Another video again, her dancing. It, it, I guess it's quite swag, you know, dressed in designer clothing, dancing in the middle of a UAE desert, drinking some wine, you know, that's a swag bit. I think of a DJ. There's some swag involved there, but God Almighty, man! And it gets quite cold in the desert when this, when, when, yeah, right. When the sun sets, it gets quite cold, right? I'm assuming the the temperatures sort of like uh, swing wildly on both ends. <laughs> I can't imagine a worse place to be, honestly, I really can't. <sighs> I don't know, man. So yeah, DJs will do anything for the cash and it looks like ravers will go anywhere for the rave. It's like a match, a match, match made in absolute heaven, mate. Absolute heaven. Um, I question everything about it. I don't really know what's going on there, but again, we're not there, we're here, so we don't have to worry about it, I guess, in all some extent. So, moving on, moving on in, we've got the most delightful, crunchy, uh, important news to talk about, an update on the, uh, it looks like a never ending uh, affair, it looks like, right? A back and forth that started pretty, in a, no, it's instantly enough. Let's say instantly. No, it's instantly. It's not instantly. Yeah, there's an update. Yeah, we have an update on the whole Dennis, Dennis, Daniel Wang, and Peggy Goo beef that we all didn't really want to be, you know, entertaining or to be looking at. But because we've got nothing else to do and we're all bored at home, waiting to go back to the dance floor, we're just occupying our times observing um, this absolute shit show of an affair that seems to be. Um, picking up steam every day, even though for the most part, the crux of the matter seems to be Daniel Wang and Peggy Goo to leave in the same building. Peggy Goo was um, sort of, you know, uh, learning her trade under the tutelage of Daniel Wang. And then sometime along that, somehow along that journey, they fell out. Um, Peggy Goo then, dis, you know, in that same time, ascended and became a DJing superstar. And that led to her turning into a bad neighbor who did various things like wear too much makeup and put on too much perfume and steal people's furniture and put up too many shelves for shoes. And that is it right and Danny Wang turned this into an entire back and forth where he used the opportunity to you know uh point how uh, how bad of a person well, how much bad of a person she is and the fact that um she has mentally and somewhat physically uh, tormented him this entire time via her attitude and solicitating of responses from other people and somehow he ended up teaming up with Vakula of all people and having him co-sign his argument just a complete horror show of a situation and of course I've been covering here on this channel this back and forth and again there's an update right so it looks like uh Danny Wang has kind of responded to Peggy Goo's uh video that she posted up on her Instagram uh via Instagram TV you know kind of you know hitting back at some of the claims not really hitting back but disputing it and also telling uh Dan Daniel Wang to kind of jog on um but yeah I, I would like to point out just to be very clear because I think I had some comments people saying oh you don't understand what Danny Wang's talking about he's a respected DJ he knows what he's doing Peggy Goo is not you I'm no fan of Peggy Goo, right? I, I don't really listen to her stuff. I like Starry Night. I played that out a few times when that came out. It's a banger. It goes off on the dance floor. Any DJ that tells you anything different is lying. Um, I liked her um, At Night remix that she put together. Even if she didn't do it, I don't care. It's got her name on it. It was cool. I like that track. I'm a big fan of Daniel Wang too. Like I mentioned previously, his article that he put together for Cocktail D'Amour back in the days on uh, electronics, electronic beats uh, website in like 2014, 15 was the reason why I went to Cocktail D'Amour in the first place, right? Um, he obviously that big tune, that big disco track that he put out in 2007 or whatever that I mentioned it. Um, oh, 
uh, like some dream, whatever it's called. Yeah, like some dream or whatever that track is called. I played it out a few times. He's got a couple of other remixes that I'm a big fan of, and generally he seems like a good egg. Right? I've got no, I've got no horse in this race. I don't really care about either of them personally. But my point of view, my position on this matter is that I'm not a fan of any man going online and publicly uh, slating another woman in any fashion whatsoever i think it's unbecoming of a man to do so i think women can do it to themselves because you know that's what women do i guess go back and forth and bicker online and gossip and all that malaga i think that's all, all well and good all well and fair i think men to a certain extent can do it but also i think men have a short um fuse or a short window of back and forth arguments before it turns physical so that kind of is out the window but i think in no way shape or form should any man regardless of what happens regardless of what happens should go online and publicly attack somebody especially somebody that happens to be in the same profession as them um in order to kind of get their message across it just doesn't work for me and then again going to develop the argument a bit further i think if you're a dj and you're a professional dj at the highest level and you have a bit of a public profile you owe it to yourself and your peers and the industry at large not to attack somebody that you work with online on a public forum in any way shape or form it doesn't help anybody it doesn't serve the scene doesn't serve the community doesn't serve you and anything it kind of splits and splinters the fan base that's already looking to rally behind people and be sort of a tribal just because of the very nature of the music itself and just how humans are right people are already split in general right which is annoying they're splitting camps in terms of uh, genres in terms of clubs in terms of sexual orientation whatever it may be right it's always really annoying that way that we have um it's, it, i guess it's somewhat annoying that you have a specific club for a specific type of people but i also understand you want to go to these places to feel comfortable but then i think that that separation can cause further division in the scene where everyone's sort of like in their own little circle and doing their own little thing i think we're more than i think we have so many great teachers out there at the moment so many great parties so many great places to go to that you can sort of live and coexist amongst other people without it turning into a beef without it turning to a back and forth that's a need to happen um and that's i guess is being exasperated by this constant back and forth that these guys are having and it looks like it's not going to slow down anytime soon because daniel wang replied so of course as you uh, most of you people are aware i obviously posted a video about this stuff where i sort of spoke about it and uh daniel wang replied in the comments which i pinned here on the top this is my this is the top video i'm sure most of you guys have seen let's go back to the video but it's there and he basically updated it um regarding the issue and sort of kind of laid out what his kind of um feelings were post his initial text that he put out on facebook so this is the following hi everyone daniel wang himself and again this is what he said supposedly i don't know it could be anybody this could be some stranger that decided to type the same way he types but it looks like it probably is him so it says hi everyone daniel wang himself here i feel silly trying to explain or even participating um thanks for the host for acknowledging some good things i've done the tune you name i'm not proud of it but i was a naive kid was 27 years ago i've done my best to document my heroes and teachers francis francois k frankie knuckles t scott etc for almost 30 years now because i believe deeply in all the positive aspects of dance music culture i hope you guys understand i was put into this horrible situation and not of my own choosing i was ready hoping to just forget it but stories from all over berlin and beyond kept coming in I could see that this was much bigger than just uh, about me or the feud with a neighbor and everyone else was scared to speak. Okay, I take umbrage with this because it feels like, again, I don't remember the, I can't remember exactly, but if reading for it, but when I read for it the first time, I couldn't exactly pinpoint what kind of, uh, what kind of prompted Daniel Wang to go out there and start blasting Peggy Goo in public. I don't actually know what happened. Like, what exactly was the thing that happened? He didn't actually detail it. He detailed all the kind of instances where she's been a bad neighbor and manipulative and a bit of a dick and all this stuff and entitled and self centered, de blah, de blah, blah, blah. But I didn't actually see what actually happened that made him decide to put that online at that time on that day, regardless. I don't really see what the thing was. So that was where I've always had a bit of an umbrage with. And then, of course, doing it in a fashion that he did, where he sort of like took a few pers sort of like personal attacks. Here and there it just opened the floodgates up to absolute wankers to start you know commenting on their people who i'm sure daniel wang wouldn't want to count as fans to go on there use the opportunity to just kick 
you know, Peggy Goo while she's down because you just don't like her or they just don't like girls, whatever the fact is, isn't it? So that's the issue there. So he has to take some responsibility there to open to open the floodgate to trolls. But hey, what can you do? Honestly, he says here, honestly, I have zero, um, I have almost zero close friends who are those I be for jet set people. I fly EasyJet and Ryanair. If I must, I often uh, took 60 to 150 euro flights for, for fun jobs at a bar or a side gig in Poland. I'm a normal guy who needs no luxuries. I never accepted it as a normal or okay to demand 10,000 or 20,000. But if some people can get that after much hard work and with good attitude, good answer, for example, I know him well. I don't blame them at all. Peggy, as you can see in my text, is a monster. People from around the globe have been sending me um, their abuse stories of her and they're horrendous. All true. Again, they're, they're horrendous to a certain extent. She looks, she, she, she sounds like the kind of person you probably want to want to go on a holiday with. But is she fucking sugar night? Probably not. Let's relax. Um, if I had to just, if I just shut up, I would go crazy. I hate the storms on social media, but if all her power and influence are delivered, no, sorry, are derived from her lies and staged image on social media, then I could only present the truth and reverse the damage on social media as well. I'm not a hater or a fighter by nature. I hate conflicts and hurting people. Oh, you've done a good job here my friend but i had to step up because nobody else would could or would thanks again i take real umbrage like again this is my own point of view i'm really skeptical of this idea that just because he's been in the game for 25 years and he's happy going on 50 quid easy jet flights and he doesn't need much money that this isn't an issue about jealousy this is what it seems like to me it sounds like to me that daniel wang is a very storied and popular and very well respected dj in the industry but just like anybody else just like any other human that's walking the face of the earth especially somebody in a field like djing where there's no clear path to success no clear path to the top where everyone has a very different and personal journey to get where they need to get to might have suffered through a bit of jealousy along the way especially if you're living in the same building you're seeing her coming in on the, in a bloody uber decked out in amazing clothes with great looking friends playing amazing music um getting mad random boxes sent to her apartment all the time then you're you know uh, stalking on social and seeing that she just got sent an amazing louis vuitton trench coat and this stuff and that stuff and you're well within your eyes to sit there and think why not me why not me and i think that's perfectly okay but to suggest that this isn't a jealousy thing and this is just you trying to be a good person and stand up for the scene and all this sort of thing is really 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 not true in my opinion that's what i think i just think it just stems mostly from a jealousy point of view and it's somewhat understandable it really is right it's somewhat understandable why do i say that it's somewhat understandable because there's this interview from 2000 and what 15 courtesy of electronic beats right the same place that he read that amazing article regarding cocktail dear more and the headline says D disco professor daniel wang digs into the infinite past to inform the present dj of culture so it seems like even though i haven't been paying attention that daniel wang is a little bit of a uh gatekeeper a little bit of a chin stroker right he's that dude that's going to like you know be commenting on your mix uh whether or not it's clanging, your song selection, your this, your that, blah, 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 whether or not you're playing vinyl or sometimes those kind of things. You know, he's got his, uh, um, he's a little bit, what's that, what's that word people say? Um, uh, there's a phrase for it, but regardless, right, he's that kind of guy. And I picked up some quotes here that might kind of inform why he has such a hard on for Peggy Goo and why he's taking this time out to make sure that he tells her off um and make sure she acts the way that he wants to act in order for her to have a successful dj career so this is one of his quotes on his interview where he speaks about various different things concerning his dj practice and you know his influence whatever he says today more than ever i consider myself as a non-traditional non-conservative but maybe i'll call myself a preservationist preservationist right everybody knows it but many people wouldn't admit it that dj careers today are built on downloading new tracks and selling new stuff that no one needs it's a lot it's a lot like clothes so let's imagine that they were living together this time or they probably weren't but let's just imagine the scene was changing there was obviously a bit of a changing of the guard um the kind of old school approach of just kind of doing your thing in silence and not really publicizing on social media and just playing your same sort of like you know um mark same markets every year same circuit it was kind of changing the influx of festivals of random clubs popping up and all this malarkey was coming all over the place streaming platforms and then suddenly now the 
the image of the DJ was very important, right? How you present yourself on social media in any way, work, in any shape or form was a very, very important in how you were able to kind of attract new business, attract new fans, and ultimately allow you to boost your signal. So it's no surprise that somebody that has this sort of point of view wouldn't actually vibe that well with a Peggy Goo. Another quote. Without that knowledge, I think that uh, people are not qualified to call themselves DJs. So already he's one of these people that admonishes others for not doing the things that he does and then, you know, classifying them as not DJs, which is odd, right? I think we should all coexist the way you want to. You can ignore what you want, pay attention to what you want to. But we digress. Because they don't understand what happened in that period, if you don't understand what happened culturally, technologically, musically, black people, white people, all the mix of the cultures, you can't call yourself a DJ. So I'm pretty sure <laughs> he probably doesn't even rate her. Forget rating Peggy as a person. He doesn't even rate her as a DJ. He probably thinks she's, you know, she, she doesn't need to even exist. So that's that can explain a lot of some of his vitriol he has towards her. He says, I'm you can't even call yourself a DJ. I'm sorry. People who stick and electronic music uh just so this four by four formula and three of three or the mindless minimal techno stuff you can call yourself a dj the same way mcdonald's can call itself a restaurant bad analogy because mcdonald's is one of the best restaurants in the world and i have no one say anything different about it it continues you serve music as they serve fast food um it's not good food it's not interesting it's not content um and it's bad for people who consume it so again explains a lot about why he doesn't like Peggy Yu. Uh, last quote here, is the last one? Yeah, look at the bottom. I'm, I'm a, it says, uh, this is a thing about, what's the question? Um, there is there is a theory that you can only be a good DJ if you're a good dancer, right? I don't know where that theory comes from, but I guess I guess it makes sense if you look at, but it's not true, is it? Because the first person I think of that can't dance is Ben UFO, right? He doesn't look like the person that can pop, lock and rock, does he? But he's a pretty fearsome DJ. But he continues, who knows? He says, I'm a pretty good dancer, but I'm not the best, right? And I think I'm a good DJ because I have a sense of what feels right. And I do believe you should be interested in dancing to be a good DJ. But it also depends on the audience you're appealing to. Now, that sentence, right? I honestly thought he was going to say the same way he said, I'm not a good, I'm a pretty good DJ, but not the best. I thought he was going to say, I'm a pretty good DJ too, but I don't think I'm the best. But instead, he really uses opportunity to really say, no, I am that guy. Come and see me play. I'm the best. So you already see the reason why someone like this wouldn't get on with a Peggy Goo, right? If he doesn't even rate her as a DJ and thinks that she just downloads tracks and puts someone through USB, she doesn't engage with the music, she doesn't know the history and all this sort of other stuff, it makes sense why he would think her success was somewhat undeserving. It continues, especially nowadays. And uh, this is, again, quite critically, um, when you're at big festivals, they don't even offer a dance floor. It's a big stadium where everyone is facing the same direction. And there are also people who are less interested in dancing than in the pure essence of music, the physical excitement of hearing it. And it's almost pure form of listening. Now, maybe it's just me because I'm, I'm a Brit and we're the home of festivals. We have some of the best festivals in the world, but I'm really pissed off about this DJs constantly complaining of having to play festivals. Yes, it's different. Yes, a festival isn't a dingy 500 capacity nightclub somewhere. We know it, but it's a different arena, a different platform. You should showcase your skills in a different way. I think being able to play, uh, uh, it's same like nightclub being able to play in nightclub that's got a thousand capacity p thousand cap and plus and a place that's 500 and under you have to approach it differently i'm assuming stylistically right in terms of the tunes you play the textures that you're kind of trying to uh you know emit from the from the comfort of the dj booth you approach them in different ways that is the thing so i don't see why somehow uh, festivals are different and it's also a bit annoying too because it seems like a lot of these djs survive primarily um through the festival circuit right festivals usually for the most part from what i heard um speaking to people behind the scenes pay pretty well right or they pay maybe you know a bit better than stuff that you do in in gigs um sorry in clubs if you can maybe stack a few of them up back to back especially with festivals now ranging anywhere they're usually all year round they're not even just reserved for the summer seasons right you can make a pretty penny going to place places so when these teachers constantly complain about festivals not being like nightclubs and not being a true essence of dance music it's like okay cool they don't play them but they still go and play them anyway so you know put that away in the bin mate or you know fold it up in your back pocket and have a walk he continues um 
there are also and there's also people who are less interested in dancing than pure music of incense so it's almost a pure form of listening but this is wrong because the whole purpose of dance music is to introduce a physical interpersonal participation which was absent in the traditional form of concert halls to turn um the dance floor into a concert arena is gutting the dance music of its original meaning and replacing that with only commerce so you can see he's somewhat pretentious right so this makes a lot of sense why somebody like him wouldn't like um an influencer come dj in the shape of a peggy goo and then it got me thinking let's look at the timeline and think about it right i was thinking why would somebody like a daniel wine be so bothered about a what 50 what, 98 kg soaking wet peggy goo um who seems pretty inoffensive um outside looking from the outside in of course if you know her personally she seems like a bit of a uh, you know a bit of a dragon in terms of her personality but she doesn't really bother anyone she plays her sets wherever she plays them she seems to have a crowd that seem to like what she does and you just have to keep it moving but i think i'll be thinking hold on and, and most likely you know from what i remember she probably what started djing properly professionally to a high level from what 2017 onwards at most so it's not even like they're occupying the same sort of um client customer base or you know clubbing whatever programming uh platform right it's just a different approach then i went on ra and thought oh this makes a lot of sense so if you go on ra right and you go on peggy's dates so this is this is ra here got a list of dates and stuff and i clicked on 2017 which i think might have been the time that she kind of blew up and kind of got out there right because if you look at some of the previous dates there aren't many parties there that she was playing or that got listed here some local stuff that she did when she was south korean stuff but for the most part it seems like it started to really kick off from 2016 onwards but in 2017 if you look here that's when you got a real variety of flags where she was and dates and stuff and it went you know just absolutely batshit crazy so if we look from here onwards right from jan from the top 2017 and then you go on the next tab here with daniel wang's gigs and the same on the 2017 there's definitely a big disparity in terms of total now i haven't counted them all but i could easily say she probably has 60 on here for the year or maybe more and i guess daniel wang probably has maybe 30 at, at, at best so this might explain why somebody like a daniel wang would be annoyed because there has to be a sense of jealousy and a sense of um undeserved sense of like he has to maybe feel somewhat um that she doesn't deserve her success that she shouldn't be on the level that she is in terms of the places she's playing because you know it's not that she's playing like shitty places right you look at january onwards right i'm just gonna name the venues it's from 2017 the scored uh you got war milano you've got panorama bar sub club in glasgow you've got uh moles in wales you've got hidden in manchester you've got flux fraggle in portugal you've got primary in chicago le bain in new york you got electric pickle in miami right tel aviv japan uh Le, Le Sucre in Leon. Uh, you've got Ireland in Bristol. You've got a couple of gigs here in Ireland, Spain, Greece, uh, Croatia, of course. Why not? You've got La Fest in Serbia, Sunfall in London, like some absolutely mad, mad, like prime. Yeah, Mondo in Madrid, some banging, banging locations she's playing at. So you can imagine somebody like a Daniel Wang, 25 or 20 plus years in the scene, seeing someone like a Peggy Goo, who number one, doesn't rate musically, doesn't think she's a good DJ. And then number two, she seems like a bit of a you know, B-I-T-C-H in person. It can definitely send you over the edge, but I still think this is, way overboard i don't think something like this needs to be spoken about in public especially from a man i think you don't ever ever uh publicly admonish a woman in this regard you have to kind of speak take it to them personally in some way shape or fashion and if you can't then you just keep it moving and kind of keep your distance but entering into this back and forth online with a dj is just very untoward especially professionally i'm just not a big fan of it and then i guess to close another update here uh danny wang decided to update this again um, with another post on his Facebook saying the following, kind of updating, this is what, a couple of days ago, right? It said, I really want to avoid more attention now and the repetition of the same story. So look at that, you scroll and look how long the story is, right? <laughs> so he's this guy, I think he kind of enjoys um, hearing the sound of his own voice, like some people.
Anyway, yeah, so he so says, um, but to emphasize the credibility and the gravity, gravity, quote unquote, of my story, Jan Engel, who worked in Berlin for two years with Peggy Goo as well, just posted this on Facebook, see below on my timeline and says he is even ready to testify under oath in support. Now, did, now is, he, is he joking or is he, or is he being for sincere? Under oath, bruv, did she kill your cat or something? Like, what the flip are these people going on? Like, what is wrong with you? Under oath. Okay, she orders too many stuff um she shouts at her interns so what bruv like really so what this is nonsense under oath anyway i received messages from strangers around the planet about the abuse suffered from peggy Goo. even former classmates at london college of fashion in 2013 2013 describing how peggy Goo bullied up students and stole things with no qualms horrific i'm saving all these screenshots bruv she is an absolute savage bruv she was bullying man in 2013 when she had no clout fair enough if you got i think the the whole like bullying and being a bit of a bitch and a diva you can sort of get away with it when you've got a bit of clout in the scene it seems like again i don't i would never let someone get away with something like that right you can't come at me with that sort of energy in you know in real life or online but you can sort of get away with it in the scene if you've got a bit of clout, right? If you've got a bit of, uh, if you've got a name to yourself, right? If you've got an influence, people want to kind of just suck your dick and keep it moving. But in 2013, when she was just a, what? Your run-of-the-mill Asian girl trying to chase her dreams in London in fashion school. She was bullying people in 2013. And you can imagine, and let me tell you about London College of Fashion. It's not full of some chumps, right? It's full of people who, you know, for the most part, believe in a very um, delusional way in their ability to make clothes or to be involved in fashion. So for her to go in there and bully people, oof, that's something. Um, I wish to make it very clear that I am against any misogyny or racism. Many people have mentioned that me describing the overpowering makeup and perfume is sexist and my wording was incorrect regarding mental illness i'm sorry for that <laughs> but i was merely trying to describe the composite psychological profile of a person who was malignant whose uh, malignant mental tendencies not uh imply that normal or even slightly too much makeup on a woman is automatically a sign of problems yeah you don't want to do that because you know what happened to jordan peterson when he said if women wear too if women wear lipstick it's a sign that they want to fuck so you have to be careful by saying these things online it continues most mental illnesses are not necessarily aggressive or directly harmful to others of course but again he mentioned it, it was just stupid what was that mentioning to be like he said something about like oh um because he kind of insinuated that her made too much makeup or whatever or fragrances was a, it was some sort of indication of her mental well-being. It's like, ah, huh? call her a bitch. Say she's self, self-absorbed self and she's undeserving of, of success in your opinion. But as, ascribing mental illness to makeup and fragrances is just like, you're no psychologist, right? You're no in public intellectual. How dare you? Uh, most of all this was not a man v woman issue at all it was only me describing my encounter with other person who happens to be a female and that person is nothing uh, is some is nothing like the other female djs and friends who i know again to personal attack like i said previously no man should publicly insult or argue or denigrate another woman online in public no way i don't i'm not a fan of it will never agree with it under any circumstance also you shouldn't publicly admonish somebody who works in your same industry also as well because it doesn't serve anyone. It doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help the scene. It doesn't help your friends. It doesn't help the fans. It even actually splits the fan base up, if any more. It becomes an us, we, them thing. It's not necessary. Deal with it behind the scenes or don't deal with it at all and do what all adults do when they don't like somebody. They move away. There are many high profile DJs, Bless Madonna and Midi Lens, name dropping, who maybe got famous quickly. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> that's a backhanded compliment if ever i've seen one in it you maybe got f famous uh, uh, quickly but my impression is they put in the hard work and still treat other people with respect what a ba the way he's like getting mad people involved in this and just like without even trying in like praising and insulting them in one breath is a skill to say the least if you're the best madonna in the media lens you'd be like hey what am i doing i'm just I didn't do nothing. Why am I involved? Uh, please stop bullying them. Should I add even those stupid crossfader memes? No DJ is perfect at any every event. That crossfader meme is funny. I think even Plasma Madonna would admit that was a funny that was a funny meme. Anyway, and there are plenty of globally less famous but great female DJs in our scene like Tamasuma, Lukuti, Budino, Deborah DeLuca. No, I'm joking. He just said Deborah DeLuca. Who have kept me dancing for hours. I have nothing against them. I even adored them. Maybe you never noticed before because unfortunately it took such a heavy and scandalous post for me to attract such sudden attention 
<sighs> that's what you wanted though, isn't it? You wanted attention, my guy. I'm sorry. It, it, this just screams jealousy for me, man, which I get. I understand, but you just have to be jealous and silence like everyone else is. You don't have to put it online or front and center because it makes you look wild. I get it, right? Like I said, he's like, look at, look at his RA. He's been DJing since. 2005 it seems on RA alone right documented list listings look at Peggy Goose I'm gonna say lib you know again uh, uh, what she says 2013 but I would say mostly she probably started around 2015 she probably you know got her own set of decks at home or something and already look at how high successful she is so I, I can definitely understand why he would be so you know upset and jealous at her position but again do like the rest of us and just keep your jealousy quiet you have to tell everybody the whole world about it but it continues um i saw peggy's da, 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 da. i saw peggy's video reply it made me sad because i still know the emotions behind the face so well her team wrote the words for her let's focus on the positive but i could see her mask was on what those glasses oh i got glasses too the serious not sexy hairdo that she knew that she had to perform this role again even though it was time for reckoning yo i think daniel wang is mentally ill you know I'm not gonna lie um i hope you all know that i had no need for attention or drama um i think you wanted all the attention and drama sir it was gut-wrenching decision but my conscience knew that i had to speak out i can change i can't change the whole system quote unquote just by addressing one individual case uh but these trump years <laughs> oh these trump years bro i don't know about this is there because is, is danny wang originally from america i'm not too sure is he originally american because he's been living in Berlin for a while, isn't it, right? Is he originally American? I'm not too sure. Let's double check here. Yeah, he's from Germany. So why is he talking about Trump? In this manner, why does it affect his world? Why does it affect his worldview? In any way, shape or form? Like, why does it inform the way that he um, talks or communicates with his peers? In any way, shape or form? I'm confused someone tell me if we pretend that culture and politics and media don't matter if we let malignant narcissists continue and amass unlimited money influence and real estate then they will soon will have power over the lives of regular innocent kind people and over cultural institutions which influence how we all think and interact has he never heard of amazon is he acting as if like peggy goo is um un unlike any other person that's come before her in this world that we live in like get guess what like I, it, this is utterly bizarre and again this is the odd thing i think i saw people so people making just odd parallels but it's odd that someone like this would have such a so, so many things to say and even people in the comments they're so opinionated about this whole issue but then when it came to the eric Murillo stuff right some of the comments and some of the stuff even i received regarding some of the comments i had when i covered it were just bizarre there were people legitimately defending and um, what Eric Miller done, right? Saying that um, he never got tried in a court of law, okay? Because of his untimely passing. They were throwing smut on the accuser's name, saying that he had his demons and all this stuff. It's like, guy, he's been accused of rape from multiple people, right? The, the, the most recent case, the lady went all the way to the end and, you know, went through the whole ordeal of getting a rape kit done and all that madness and putting herself a front first and center because the story, when I heard it through the grapevine, her, her, she had already been identified behind the scenes. People are already, you know, going out there trying to um, put a black mark against her name and try and ruin her credibility. So, and I didn't see any way, any way, shape or form the same level of, um vitriol and abuse being pointed towards some of the djs even who are posting eulogies about you know eric Mula when he passed you know like eulogies i understand you know acknowledging that he was your friend and you're missing him but i heard people posting stuff like oh he had these demons you know everyone's got issues don't judge people by the like remembering for the good stuff it's like huh? remembering for the good stuff your man got accused of allegedly assaulting numerous women over a prolonged period of time in his career behind the scenes like you read some forums and some comments some of them might be made up but for the most part people are saying that hey, he, he was doing this for a long time and it was tolerated because he was the hot stuff and he was the main guy the moment his fame or his relevancy started to dwindle somewhat people started to talk up a bit more and i didn't hear the same amount of vitriol or enthusiasm in sort of attacking the people that were sort of protecting and um in, you know covering up some of his um shortcomings and again, these aren't shortcomings, right? Assault or rape aren't shortcomings. They're even worse than shortcomings. But again, all this energy being poured towards a, you know, 98 kg 
DJ who started playing in 2016 because she's a bit rude and she's entitled like yeah these guys are insane bro like legitimately insane um I definitely didn't ask he said yeah I definitely didn't ask to be in this position yes you did and maybe I spoke up too spontaneously yes you did but when all is won and lost on social media then it takes a social media action to reach a large audience and maybe reverse the damage too again because someone told me in the comments why she sparked this because he keeps saying this what what did Peggy Goo say about him in public that would make him want to say this about her because it feels like he just came out of nowhere and just like divulged all this stuff from behind the scenes Anyway, it says, enough words. I've seen the haters in difference in the comments. I can understand that. Now I know that Beyonce and Taylor Swift have to deal with. I think that's a joke. Um, can I put an LOL emoji here? Cool. But overall, I've gotten nothing but love and support from around the globe. It feels good and I needed it very much. So what? This was a purely selfish, self-absorbed uh, uh, exercise in order for you to garner sympathy from strangers because you felt a little bit... Um, you felt what's that word you felt somewhat inadequate living in the same building as peggy goo and seeing her arrive in amazing vehicles decked out in amazing fashions and going to all the hippie parties and all this sort of stuff utterly bizarre utterly 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 bizarre and i guess that's another what this is what a part four of the ordeal and i'm really am hoping that this is the end i hope this is the end but i'm you know knowing how narcissistic and self-absorbed some djs are they're definitely going to keep going on this back and forth but nobody wins here innit? really nobody wins the people in berlin who didn't fuck with peggy anyway won't you know change their minds the people who are fans are going to keep fans of her the people that didn't know who danny wang are i'm not suddenly going to go see him play now he's not going to gain fans of this no one's going to go see you play somewhere because you decided to throw this girl under the bus or talk about how much makeup she puts on and she it's just it's i don't like again this is not me i don't even like the girl i, I could care less about her teaching it's just seems so bizarre that a grown man would want to go and attack a woman in public like this because he feels like she doesn't um uh, respect or honor the fact that she's got the position and she doesn't listen to the right music or it's like come on jog on like what is danny wang ever gonna play at circle loco anyway like do they even occupy the same scene like it doesn't they're not even this you know what i mean it's like who cares she plays dc10 you play panorama by is i don't know whatever or somewhere else or golden gate whatever do you know what i mean it's not even, not even in the same group it's just an utterly odd situation but maybe again i'm reading too much into it maybe i'm i'm seeing it from the wrong way point of view i'd love to know your thoughts and opinions in the comments as you did previously try and keep them civil don't insult me please <laughs> but let me know man like whose side of the argument do you fall on are you more of a Daniel Wang kind of person or are you more of a Peggy Goo kind of person or do you just simply not care and you think all this stuff is really really entertaining like everyone else let me know in the comments down below anyway that is the Axiom's English episode number 409. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time checking out the show, make sure you leave me a comment down below, like and subscribe and all that good stuff. If you're listening via the podcast stuff, of course, make sure you leave me a five-star review and share it with your friends. And of course, Patreon support is always warm and welcome. Patreon.com for just Agostina. Patreon.com for just A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. Subscribe on there for one bonus episode on there for Patreon fans only, as well as some other stuff coming in the future for $1 or equivalent of one pound. Don't delay. Get on there today agostino ajos agostinho patreon.com for us agost agostinho click that link get involved link in the description link down below click on there get involved until next time guys i'll see you again very very soon have a good one enjoy your weekend and i'll see you on the other side peace